Well, is it anti-Trump? Yes. Then I think we're probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down. Say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Welcome back to episode 13 of Acquired, the show where we talk about technology acquisitions that actually went well. I'm Ben Gilbert. I'm David Rosenthal. And we are your hosts. We have a very special guest today visiting us from GeekWire, Todd Bishop. Hey, it's great to be here. So great to have you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm a listener. I think yours might be the only podcast that I've listened to every episode of. Whoa. Which speaks to the fact that you're I still praise. relatively new. But uh, yeah, I, I listen, on, I listen uh, on my walks on the weekend and uh, really love what you guys do on the show. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. We're glad to have you. Yeah, it's a privilege. And uh, for this episode, it's going to be particularly interesting. Um, we're talking about the publishing industry. So we, uh, we wanted to have Todd on because we thought it would be um, particularly fascinating to listeners to get a little inside info from, um, from someone who's kind of experiencing the results of the acquisition firsthand. So uh, before we get into what the, uh, the episode's on today, uh, a couple, couple of uh, administrative things. First one, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. It's, uh, it is tremendously helpful for the future of the show as we uh, invest in better tech and we get you know, more and more guests on and we're able to do more things with the show. I um, appreciate you doing that and doing any sort of sharing on, on social media that you, uh, you feel is appropriate. Um, secondarily, we started a Slack community and we've seen some really great uh, uptake in that. So yeah, it's been really fun to chat with all you guys and um, uh, please would love more people to join. But uh, for people who are already in, keep the questions and discussion coming. It's been great. Yeah. And uh, we've got some some email asking, well, how do I join? Um, it's, it's on the acquired website. If you're on desktop, it's a little widget on the right side. You just enter your email and then it emails you how to do it. And if you are on mobile, it is down below the posts. All right, listeners, our sponsor is one of our favorite companies, Vanta, and we have something very new from them to share. Of course, you know Vanta enables companies to generate more revenue by getting their compliance certifications. That's SOC 2, ISO 27001. But the thing that we want to share now is Vanta has grown to become the best security compliance platform as you hit hypergrowth and scale into a larger enterprise. It's kind of wild. When we first started working with Vanta and met Christina, my gosh, they had like a couple hundred customers, maybe. Now they've got 5,000, some of the largest companies out there. It's awesome. Yeah, and they offer a tremendous amount of customization now for more complex security needs. So if you're a larger company and in the past you showed Vanta to your compliance department, you might have heard something like, oh, well, we've already got a compliance process in place and we can't integrate this new thing. But now, even if you already have a SOC 2, Vanta makes maintaining your compliance even more efficient and robust. They launched Vendor Risk Management. This allows your company to quickly understand the security posture of the vendors that you're choosing in a standardized way that cuts down on security review times. This is great. And then on the customization front, they now also enable custom frameworks built around your controls and policies. Of course, that's in addition to the fact that with Vanta, you don't just become compliant once, you stay compliant with real-time data pulled from all of your systems, now all of your partners' systems, and you get a trust report page to prove it to your customers. If you click the link in the show notes here or go to vanta.com slash acquired, you can get a free trial. And if you decide you love it, you will also get $1,000 off when you become a paying customer make sure you go to vanta.com slash acquired. So without further ado, uh, our episode this week is on Facebook's acquisition of Push Pop Press. Try that. Try it. Bleh. Say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, David, do you want to dive in with the history and facts? As always. So um, very interesting one here. Uh, the company, as Ben mentioned, is Push Pop Press which not many people have heard of, uh, but it was founded in February 2010 by two guys, Mike Matas and Kimon, uh, I'm probably going to butcher his last name, Sin Sinceris, I believe. Um, and they were both alums of Apple. Um, and they had been a designer, one a designer and one an engineer at Apple for about four or five years. Uh, and they had worked on the iPhone uh, in the years leading up to the launch. Yeah, and as a, a total Apple nerd, 
these guys are legendary. I mean, you look at their portfolios. They've designed everything from the, you know, the charging battery icon on the front of the iPhone for the first six software releases to maps to um, on the ben, map. Ben, you're, you're stealing my thunder here. Sorry. I literally sorry. have in my notes. So, yeah, <laughs> these guys, they weren't just any Apple engineers and designers. Uh, between the two of them, they designed the first... Uh, the first versions of the camera app, the photos app, the maps app, the settings app, the battery display, um, the photos app for the iPad, and time machine and photo booth for the Mac. Well, I should stop doing anything from memory ever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite impressive, guys. Um, and interestingly, while they were working on Push Pop Press, which was only for about two years... Um, Mike was also working on the side. I don't know which was the side gig and which was the permanent gig, um, but he was one of the first people working on Nest. And nobody knew what Nest was at this point, but um, they were the secretive startup uh, from former Apple uh, folks, and um, Mike was also part of that team. He was, and, and Mike's had his, his hands in really great software for a long time. He's, uh, for the Seattleite listeners out there, he's actually a native Seattleite and worked on uh, some really incredible Mac software that is is pixel perfect called Delicious Library from uh, Delicious Monster That's right. with uh, Will Shipley. And that, you know, as a, a, I, you know, yet again, Apple nerd and, and like admirer of great software is is really kind of setting the bar for creating great UX. And one of the greatest startup names ever, right? <laughs> yes. Delicious monster, yes. <laughs> Indeed. So um, we have these two superstar uh, engineers and designers from Apple. If they leave, they start Push Pop Press. What is Push Pop Press, one might ask? So at TED, at the TED conference in spring of 2011, they unveil uh, at the conference what they've been working on. And it was an attempt to reimagine the book. Uh, what does the book look like on, uh, on a mobile computer, both tablets and phones, smartphones? Um, and the first book that they launched was in conjunction with Al Gore, um, who interestingly was an Apple board member and also... Um, uh, at the time, I believe, still affiliated with uh, the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins, which was an investor in Nest. Mm. Um, and uh, they worked with him to launch his book called Our Choice, uh, which was about the environment. Um, and it was an incredibly beautiful uh, app. It was released as an app within the uh, Apple App Store. It was only on iOS. Um, and the technology behind it that pushed Pop Press uh, created enabled highly, highly immersive interactions with, um, again, really a reimagining of what a book was with interactive content, with audio, with video, all seamlessly integrated into this experience. Yeah, and one of the things to note about that was, you know, it's it's still not it's not an easy thing to imagine a really immersive, beautiful, um, kind of perfect animation curve. Um, application like this, that that alone is hard. The engineering, especially on on those real early um, iOS devices, is particularly difficult. And these were kind of the the two guys in the world that could that could build that you know envision that that incredible experience. And then uh, yeah, we're, we're talking it. early iPads and like iPhone four four S time frame. Yeah. Um, and actually, interestingly, now we we can't verify this, confirm or deny, but it has been reported in the press that this actually might have gotten into them into a little bit of trouble. Um, because apparently, again, according to um, some articles out there, we don't know if this is true or not, but apparently Steve Jobs uh, noticed when these guys left and noticed what they were working on. And he believed that um, a lot of the technology that they used to build Push Pop Press was actually alarmingly similar to some of the patented technology that they had developed while they were at Apple mm. working on iBooks. So he, again, supposedly got a little upset about this. Mm. Mm. Good thing uh, there's no uh, non-compete provisions in California, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, this was actually an IP issue. Right. Um, this was a patent issue, supposedly. Um, so... Uh, this was uh, this was after they launched at TED in, in 2011. And then interestingly, at WWDC that year in June, um, not everybody at Apple was too upset because 
uh, our choice and Push Pop Press actually won an Apple Design Award uh, for the iPad as being one of the best designed apps, according to Apple, on the iPad that year. Um, but nonetheless, very shortly thereafter, in the beginning of August of 2011, Facebook announces that they have acquired Push Pop Press for an undisclosed amount. Um, and again, supposedly, according to these articles, the fact that um, Jobs was kind of on the warpath about this and upset about some of the potential IP violations regarding books um, and apps um, might have contributed to the outcome here and not continuing to go along as a standalone company. No mm -hmm. way for us to know. Interesting hypothesis. I never never took it there before. I, I, a note on this acquisition, I think it's safe to assume that it's a pretty small sum. Um, not, you know, not a big team, very early stage. But what it did represent, I remember thinking this at the time, I had, I had bought the book. It was incredible to play with. Um, had great reverence for sort of the technology behind it. And I was thinking, man, Facebook just keeps buying up and sort of, we don't know if this was an aqua hire, but had done several acquisitions before of teams that were just incredible iOS designers and developers. And I was like, they really have a war chest there. And thinking back to that time period, I mean, this was still a great state of flux for, for Facebook in the mobile era. They were doing the hybrid web thing. They hadn't yeah. managed to, to translate their, you know. The, the, the Facebook apps were not native on iPhone and, and Android. They were doing the the wrapper you know, development, it was, it was a mess. Right, and their mobile future was uncertain with their ad revenues. I mean, they yep. hadn't translated their cash cow from desktop yet. And you know, as we know, they were they had become incredibly successful with the, uh, the newsfeed ad. It's one of the best ad units in history. B but, but you're right. There were times back then, uh, I remember some, I, I believe, I don't know if they were public or not at this point, but there were big questions about whether they could translate their success into mobile apps and into, into yeah this was mobile right around the time there was an infamous recode interview at the recode conference or or uh oh, this might have been before recode uh, probably was the, back at the all things d uh, conference. at the all things d was this conference, the hoodie? Which is the way, yeah the hoodie where <laughs> where mark zuckerberg was being grilled on stage by well uh walt mossberg and kara swisher and yes. he had a hoodie on and he was sweating yes. profusely and he was being grilled about mobile and facebook's missing of mobile uh and he ended up taking the hoodie off and it was and then it had that like that illuminati yeah. or something thing yeah. inside it it was like <laughs> very very cultish. embarrassing moment uh, <laughs> but others have speculated that that was that moment was the turning point when he realized that facebook needed to go all in on mobile um, and they really did after that yeah uh, and this acquisition was part of it now interestingly and then we'll, we'll wrap up the history and facts here um as has been mentioned, we don't know the price of the acquisition. We have to assume it was quite small. Push Pop Press had never raised any money. It was just the two of them and a couple other people who were working on it. Um, but when they were acquired, they actually, the founders actually wrote on the website, um, on their blog, um, that they were this was just about them and the technology. They were not going to continue um, pub, uh, in the book industry. They, they write, although Facebook isn't planning to start publishing digital books, the ideas and technology behind Push Pop Press will be integrated with Facebook, giving people even richer ways to share their stories. With millions of people publishing to Facebook every day, we think it's going to be a great home for Push Pop Press. Cough. Publishing. Cough. Cough. <laughs> Publishing. Not books. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, let's get into it. I mean, well, just, well, just to wrap it up quickly. So then the team goes, the two of them go on and they work on two things that they're still working on at Facebook. Um, first is Facebook Paper, which many people don't remember, but this is a standalone app that Facebook launched in early 2014 that's basically a Flipboard competitor. Yeah, and if you look at this, this was the first thing, um, I think it might have been conditional upon the acquisition, but uh, Mike Mattis got to run Facebook Creative Labs, and this was kind of the product to launch out of Creative Labs. And the animations and the sensibilities from from uh, Push Pop Press's book are just like right there in paper. I mean, the whole immersive design philosophy, very smooth curves between things, you, you can tell it's the same team. And although paper, it still exists, you can still download it in the App Store. It's only on iOS, uh, much mm -hmm. like Push Pop Press. Um, hasn't been a huge success, but it informs the real, it was the Trojan horse to the real meat here is that this Push Pop Press becomes, and, and these guys are, are the product leaders of Facebook Instant Articles. Yeah, and I think uh, Mike was and recently left but uh, but Kimon, or I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that, is still there. Ah, Mike, what are you doing now? If uh, 
Call us. <laughs> I, I, I believe I, – so I follow him on Instagram. He's like a tremendous nature photographer, and he's, he's, he's doing a lot of traveling. I think he's taking some time. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm sure well-deserved. Um, but Instant Articles is really – I'm sure many of our listeners know about it, but this is really game-changing um, uh, product that, that Facebook launched last year. Um, and it was interestingly – Todd, I'm sure you'll appreciate this. The The fact that they were working on it was scooped by David Carr at the yeah. New York Times um, at the in fall of 2014. And then it ends up coming out in spring of 2015. And I, I believe the opening line of his article where he talks about this is that Facebook is like a big dog in the park that is galloping at you <laughs> and you don't know if it wants to play with you <laughs> or eat you. <laughs> oh my God, that is so perfect. So perfect. That, if you are that. a publisher. Exactly, exactly. Boy, I, I'm, I'm in the park, man. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, guys are in the park. <laughs> we are, we are. So uh, in preparation for this, I spent quite a bit of time with our analytics just getting a sense for what we get from Facebook, what we give to Facebook, um, we get uh, roughly 10% of our traffic from Facebook. And um, is it the largest single? It's referral? the largest. Yep. It's it, other than organic search. Yep. So if you look at organic search, it's, you know, close to half. But um, in terms of this, uh, in terms of actual, you know, dedicated inbound uh, referrers. Um, so, so it's quite a bit of traffic. Now, in the old school publishing mentality, Publishers would think, I've got to get users on my site. Yeah. That is where I'm, you know, converting them uh, into, you know, potential e-commerce customers, yep. or I'm getting them on my email list. Exactly. And I think Instant Articles is one of the best examples of that mentality shifting for publishers that are a little more progressive. And and we should say yeah. a word too about what it is for people who haven't yeah. really dug into the product. This is a major change in the way. Um, content and articles uh, that is owned and written by publishers are is being distributed. So before instant articles, if somebody shared a, a link to an article on Facebook and you clicked on it on mobile, you would be taken to the mobile browser and read the article on the, on the page, as Todd was saying, the publisher's page. But with instant articles, publishers are actually giving their content over to Facebook. It's being hosted on Facebook servers and then displayed in a very push pop press like um, beautiful, immersive um, uh, reader that loads instantly rather than clicking through to the mobile web and waiting for uh, everything to load. And more, even more importantly for this discussion, um, Facebook can sell and serve its own advertising within the article. Now, publishers can too, but and if publishers sell the ads in the article, they keep 100% of the revenue, but Facebook can also sell in and then they keep 30% of the revenue. Yeah, and uh, to, to put some numbers behind um, the how much faster it is, they say an, an average um, web page article takes about eight seconds to load, and people just bounce off that a tremendous amount. They click Especially in, on they, mobile. Yeah, yeah, and they say it's 10 times faster in an instant article. Yeah, I can't count the number of times when I've gone, this is not worth it. I'm going back and finding something else to, to read. So I think that whole construct and that assertion of theirs is very valid based on just casual everyday user experience. But this is a mentality shift for publishers because, you, you know, you, you've got so many readers on Facebook already and, and the old school mentality is, hey, we, we, get, we need to get them on our site. But when you start talking about the monetization, that's when it starts to go, okay, well, you know, to go back to your dog park analogy, maybe I'll let you know Facebook. You know, I don't know. I don't want to lick say my face. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That, that's much better than what I was going to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, that is the thing. Um, we've actually experimented with instant articles a little bit, and I should say this is part of a sort of broader set of these types of approaches. You know, Google has accelerated mobile pages, mm -hmm. very similar. We've actually had a lot more success with AMP uh -huh. than we have with instant mm -hmm. articles. Um, Apple News, of course, and then Flipboard. Um, yep. You know, all these things are examples of publishers saying, hey, okay, the articles don't need to be on our site, but what do we get in return mm -hmm. for allowing you to host them? And really for us, it's the monetization. With Facebook Instant Articles, Apple News, we have not yet seen the kind of user base that mm -hmm. would justify putting a lot of effort into it and because the revenue just isn't there yet. Google is actually a bit of an exception because 
they're so integrated with DFP, Double Click for Publishers. Yep, yep. And it's our native system. Google gets it. You know, so in that way, I think Google may have a bit of an advantage in terms of the monetization and then in attracting publishers in this yeah. whole instant article world. So that's, that's our view. Yeah. Even though uh, Facebook probably has a significant advantage in terms of traffic. Exactly. Yes. But Google I mean, has much better monetization tools for you. Yes. For us as a publisher. Hmm. Um, but but there's no denying the reality of Facebook's yeah, user, so user base. I'm curious, you know, how do, how do you and John think about this? Yeah. Like, you know, in, in the, we were talking before we started about, you know, old web publishers. You know, Todd yeah. worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer. I worked at the Wall Street Journal back in the day. And, you know, I mean, the cost structure at the Journal, we spent a billion dollars every year on everything, putting out the paper and, um, you know, creating the website and all this. And it was all about, you know, creating that relationship with the reader. Yeah. And now we live in a different world. How do you... Yeah, it's definitely changed. Um, we talk about our publishing process just as an example. We'll publish a story on WordPress and then every reporter for us, the next step is to go to Facebook. And you're really not done publishing until you've published a link on Facebook. And so obviously Instant Articles takes that a step further, further because it's just automatically populating that with the, the cached version, the, uh, the push pop press version essentially. So, you know, it's just, you think of your readers in a much broader way than just the people who are on your site. You think about other things too, like we've been experimenting a lot with retargeting and the whole notion of once a reader leaves your site, uh, you can still serve them ads from yourself for our, for our events, for example, or for your advertisers on behalf of your advertisers on Facebook. So mm -hmm. we, we think about it as it's much more holistic now. Yeah. And in that way, Facebook has broadened the horizons, yeah. right? They've taken away the audience, but they've also opened the door for yeah. you to get there. Well, it used to be. I mean, uh, every publisher, large and small, had their own ad sales force, right? right? right. And that was where a huge part of the costs you know, at the Journal and elsewhere were. Um, but the ability to sell that audience was so limited relative to a Facebook. And so now you live in a world where it, it probably doesn't really make sense for you for, as a publisher to invest a lot in your own ads if you can just well, click a button. Well, I, I, I think, think a, couple, couple, a few people back at the office are yeah. going to be listening very intently yes. to this. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, we have a, a strong... Well, but not to have a... Yeah. Not to have, you know, I mean, we had hundreds of ad yes, sales people exactly. at, at the... You know, I'm sure you guys don't have hundreds we of have ad three. sales. We yeah. have three. We have three. And the advantage there, obviously, is that in terms of direct sales, you can provide more value you can provide custom packages, you can bundle in events, and so your margins are higher um, than just going through some kind of network buy. So it, for us, at least at our size, there's still a big value in having direct sales. Not, not to mention you actually know what experience is being delivered to your reader. I mean, you, you don't have to hope and pray that some network is inserting the, a thing that you want next to your content. Oh, that's absolutely right. Yeah. So that, that is the, the control issue is something there. And that's all about just making sure you're delivering the right value to the reader and to the, to the sponsor. Hmm. Yeah. For, for accelerated mobile pages for Google and for, for Facebook, Facebook instant articles, do you guys do your own ad sales or do you trust the, uh, do you hand that off to them and take the 30% so cut? We've only done a little testing with instant articles and actually it's a whole other issue. We've run into a, a problem with the plugin created by Facebook and Automatic, the creator of WordPress. And this is, like I said, this could be a rat hole, so you can edit this out later, Ben. <laughs> but they, they, need, they have some work to do on that plugin, and so we haven't been able to fully test that. Um, and, and that's the plugin that it theoretically makes it easier for publishers that, that Facebook can go in and automatically suck out your content and then put it into an instant article without you doing a whole lot of work? That's right, exactly. Um, for Google Accelerated Mobile Pages, just because of the extension from DFP, all of our ads can go there. So we can, if we direct sold an ad that appears on the site, it can go into the, into instant art, or you can go into AMP, into accelerated mobile pages. Wow. Huge advantage to Google it, on that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, as a, a consumer and a reader, I'm, I'm much more a fan of Facebook and inst instant articles yep. because you get this experience where I'm in a native experience. It's already downloaded all the content for the article and I just go right into it. And on mobile pages, it, you know, it's always, whenever you're on a website, you're keenly aware that you're on a website and it's not quite native. Yep. And so whenever, um, for those of you who haven't or, or don't know if you've hit an accelerated mobile page yet, it's when you search for something on Google 
and there's a, a result that's for a news story that sort of keeps you on the search results page, but there's an article overlaid on top of it. Um, and I'm always a little disappointed, like, yeah, it's a lighter website and it's accelerated, but it's still kind of a web page and it would be nicer if it was, if it was, you know, more native. Oh, pop press like experience. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see, to hear leg up. So let's, uh, yeah. I definitely want to keep this conversation going, but let's, let's do it. Let's move into acquisition category. All so, right. so, uh, it, even before you read their, their press release, um, I, I said that it's primarily a people acquisition, secondarily a technology acquisition. And, uh, it sure sounds like, um, we're in agreement there. Yeah. Well, I had primarily technology, secondarily people, but Ooh. you know, hey, you know, it's it's all semantics. Yeah, I'd, I'd have a hard time disagreeing with that. I mean, it, <laughs> my question is, what were they doing between 2011 and 2016? You know, if it was a talent acquisition or a technology acquisition, it took them a while. I guess it was 2015 that they came out with instant articles, but I, I think paper. I think oh, for a while they gotcha. were kind of playing gotcha. around with what what is the thing that we're going to build, and that was sort of why Creative Labs was its own little yeah. entity in Facebook before paper gotcha. came out. But I. Um, I think the team for paper actually got pretty large and it was a, a sizable effort where I, I don't know the exact quote, but I remember Zuckerberg announcing it and, and saying like, this is like a new direction for Facebook. Like this is the new way you experience Facebook. And obviously and he was of, right. It just ended up becoming within the Facebook app. Itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I think was interesting. The other thing is that, but like we were saying earlier, the core Facebook app was such a mess yeah. in those early days. I think it's, it's amazing how much functionality has been brought back into that app and how, um, how, how big that piece of software has become. Yeah. 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 Um, you want to okay. go to what would have happened otherwise? Yeah. Well, this might, this was, I think this merits an interesting detour. Let's say they'd stayed independent and continue trying to reinvent the book. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Bad idea. How does that play out? Uh, there's no way they don't get picked up. And if it's not Facebook, it's someone else. But we'll all suspend that. Like, I think it's th th they're so good and it's so inexpensive when they've built is so interesting to so many players that, like, I don't think this scenario exists. But let's go down to what would have happened if they had, had kind of reinvented the book. You know, well, all of a sudden they're competing with Amazon. And they're getting sued by Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like, it would have required, for that to really work as a business, it would have required content producers to embrace a, like writers, authors, to embrace a whole new way of, uh, a whole new medium, basically. And what's interesting about that versus what it became with instant articles is, um, you know, the, the authors of, of content, uh, Publishers don't do anything different. It just Facebook sort of you know does its magic and makes it look beautiful. And they can. Facebook wants you to. There's all these kind of unique things that you can do with um, data visualization and parallaxing uh, you know images and things like that. But you don't have to. No. Yeah. And I think probably very few. It's splashy when 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 publishers do, but they probably don't do a lot of it. Yeah. Um, probably where, hard to justify the ROI on that. Yeah. Too. Whereas you would have to create a a massive behavior change in terms of producers uh, to really reinvent the book. So likely it would have been hard. Um, well, one, one way we could see that um, yeah, proxy for that playing out is with iBooks Author. Apple came out with that software to create textbooks, and it's supposed to be exactly the same thing. Like, you know, m m things that move, things that slide, interactive ways of learning. And when they announced it on stage, you know, I was thinking, like, this is really going to require some serious things that Apple is not necessarily good at. Like, they're going to need a lot of salespeople, a lot of relationship managers, like, really to yeah. go and, and convince the five major textbook publishers, Pearson and then and, and yep. the likes of them, that, like, this is their future. Yep. And I, I, I and just don't think they doubled down on that. Yeah, it didn't, didn't work. It, yeah, it seems like the other natural acquirer here would have been Amazon. Am I, am I off base on that? I mean, just given the the books angle. Yeah, it sure seems or, like it. Or Barnes and Noble, maybe if they yep. were back because 2011. You know, they could they were still sort of in the game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That books. is cool to think about. Like, what if um, what if Kindle were beautiful? <laughs> no, no offense to anyone so working on Kindle, but it's gotten it's gotten a lot better. It has gotten a lot better. I love Kindle. It's probably my one of my most used. 
apps and, and devices. I use both the app and the device. Yeah. But um, and yeah. the the Oasis is pretty darn sweet. Do you have one? I, I've used one. Yeah, I've is tested it, one out. I would love to get one, but I just can't yeah. justify like three hundred dollars for it. Yeah, and of course, e, e ink is a whole different game than what we're talking about here. But yeah. but yeah, there's there's still lots of room for improvement in the whole digital ebook landscape. Yes, for lots sure. lots of room. Um, I, I do want to raise the point too. I think they had the luxury of being super, super selective of if they were going to get acquired, who it was going to be by. Um, they strike me as the the kind of people that if they didn't have a tremendous respect for the company and didn't feel that their principles of, of design and, and beautiful experience were sort of like embodied in the efforts of whatever that company was trying to do, I don't think they would have gone. Yeah. So I think that that narrows. Especially, I mean, they they hadn't raised any money, so there were no you know evil VCs on the board you know forcing them to sell. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I I, I think you're probably right. And and not to mention that um, you know uh, was it Mike? I think was you know working on the side or full time at Nest. So um, yeah, this was not a uh, this was not a forced sale by any means. No. This is a great time to tell you about one of our very favorite companies, Crusoe. So. Crusoe, as listeners know by now, is a clean compute cloud provider specifically built for AI workloads. NVIDIA is one of their major partners, and literally Crusoe's data centers are nothing but racks and racks of A100s and H100s. And because Crusoe's cloud is purpose-built for AI and run on wasted, stranded, or clean energy, they can provide significantly better performance per dollar than traditional cloud providers. Yes, we talked about that on our ACQ2 episode with Crusoe CEO Chase Lockmiller. The other element that makes Crusoe special is the environmental angle. Crusoe, of course, locates their data centers at stranded energy sites. So think oil flares, wind farms that can't use all the energy they generate, etc., and uses that power that would otherwise be wasted to run your AI workloads instead. Yep. Obviously, it's a huge benefit for the environment and for customers on costs since Crusoe doesn't rely on the energy grid. Energy is the second largest cost of running AI after, of course, the price you pay NVIDIA for the chips. And these lower energy costs get passed on to customers. It's super cool that they can put their data centers out there in these remote locations where, quote unquote, energy happens, as opposed to the other hyperscalers such as AWS and Google and Azure, who need to build their data centers close to major traffic hubs where the internet happens because they are doing everything in their clouds. Yep. If you, your company, or your portfolio companies would like to use the lower cost and more performant infrastructure for your AI workloads, go to crusocloud.com slash acquired, that's C-R-U-S-O-E cloud.com slash acquired, or click the link in the show notes. All right, listeners, we have a longtime favorite acquired company to tell you about, Modern Treasury. Modern Treasury is the software platform that turns money movement operations into code. Yeah, for years now, services like Stripe, Adyen, and Square have enabled developers to accept credit card payments in apps. But that's only the tip of the iceberg of what a business needs to fully handle the movement of money in and out of their company. Those payment actions from Stripe and Adyen, etc., flowed through to ledger systems and then reconciliations, compliance verifications, and that's before any cash actually moves between institutions, which of course involves banking operations. Yes, their APIs, of course, work with Plaid, Stripe, Intuit, etc., but also with their incredible banking partner network with over 30 banks, meaning that for the first time, you literally can turn your banking operations at any of those institutions into software. This means faster payments, easy adoptions of new payment rails when they come out, like FedNow. It means automatic reconciliation and real-time financial data. This lets you move money at the speed of software, which, as we now know, after the first half of 2023, being able to move money fast is very important. Yes, we love Modern Treasury so much. The founders and really the whole team have become close friends of Ben and mine really back to when they first got started. And this is a very cool full circle moment that just happened. We just emceed their first big conference here in San Francisco, Transfer, which happened at the beginning of June. Yes. If your business involves money movement, be it a marketplace, fintech platform, real estate, lending, investing, or anyone who reconciles or moves money, go on over to moderntreasury.com slash acquired and make sure that when you get in touch, you tell them that Ben and David sent you. All right, let's let's jump back into um, to tech themes because I, I think we can really unpack some some cool stuff with Todd here. Um, what uh, 
Well, uh, Todd, why don't you why don't you go first? Yeah, it, it, this really does speak to the, the the broadening horizons for publishers and and the risks and opportunities that come along with that. I mean, this is. Uh, I think a lot of you know I've been been around since the days when I had one daily deadline for you know one story that needed to get to the printing press by eleven at night you know so uh, not to not to date myself here but I, I remember those days too <laughs> from two thousand nine yeah. at the Wall Street Journal so it was not that long ago so I think you've gone through a few transitions there for publishers first obviously to the web and then to mobile and now in some ways you're seeing a fourth transition to you know beyond your own property what yeah. what, what needs what needs to happen happen what can you do who can you reach and how can you monetize it and that really is the the big theme for me here yeah so todd i've had a crazy idea for for a startup for a while and i like this is perfect time to poke holes in it could you start a publisher at this point that doesn't have a website that purely exists on on social it's 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 only on amp it's only on well one might argue this is what buzzfeed is but hmm they, they, yeah, they have a destination site. I'm curious how, how much they're a destination versus social. but I think you could, and I think you should. And uh, that would be fantastic. I think you should do yeah everything but a website. So in other words, publish on Facebook. And The, the Verge has been talking about this, and I know yeah. that I think their new gadget blog is focused almost exclusively on Facebook. Hmm. And um, I think it's The Verge. I, I get all those, The Verge and Gadget and Gizmodo, they just blend together in my mind. <laughs> After I read their They're stories. All good. I'm a big yeah, Verge fan. But, yeah. Um, the, the, well, it is the Verge, good. right? It's the, the, I, did the Gadget blog just on Facebook? I'm sure they don't know. Actually, correct but, me on that one. Yeah, I don't. David, I'm a big GeekWire fan. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the Verge and GeekWire are competitors. But yes, I'm a big GeekWire fan right, as well. Yeah, well okay. um, yeah. But it's interesting. I, uh, one of my themes was, was hinting at earlier is this sort of reinvention of the publishing industry. Yeah. I'm curious how you guys at GeekWire, I mean, you, you're such a, you are a news site, of course, right. probably first and foremost, but there's so much more to what you do. You're a community. Yeah. Um, and, and how do you think about life and your business model in, in this yeah, new world? Absolutely. So I can share a few broad details. So about roughly 60% of our revenue has nothing to do with the website. And it's not because it's coming from Facebook or anything else. Yeah. It doesn't have, it's, it's probably not accurate to say it has nothing to do with the website, but we get event revenue. I mean, that is a major driver of our business. And you were saying, you know, the, your ad sales efforts are focused on a holistic package, right? right. It's, you're, you're getting ad units on the site, but you're also getting sponsorships at events. And, you know, it's, you're offering something beyond just a website. Right. The way we look at it is that our news brings people to the site and then we create a community around that news. And then the question is, okay, you've got this great community. How can you provide value to that community and to the people who want to reach it? And if you think about it in that abstract way, then all these really interesting possibilities come up. If you just think about it as I've got people coming to my website and I want to serve them ads, then it's too simplistic and it's, you know, a decade ago mentality. So this is all part of that broader evolution and how publishers think. In, in thinking about instant articles, uh, some of the bigger publishers that have this sort of uh, uh, a, a trained behavior of a whole city going to their website every morning, much like they used to read the paper at their, their dining room table every morning, and they worry about doing something like this because it untrains that habitual behavior of going to the site. Do you guys worry at all about sort of losing that, oh, they don't, they're not used to going to GeekWire anymore? Certainly there's a core set of your readers who are, will always do that. Um, mm -hmm. But so much anymore, the front door the front yeah the front door of your website is not your home page it's an article that somebody comes into and when we think about the design of the site we think about that you know this is really the place that people are coming to so mm -hmm. and that's driven by social it's the fact that people are getting the a link off of twitter yeah. off of facebook and they're coming into your site through the back door essentially it's the phenomenon that i know i subscribe to I'm, I'm sure probably we all do and many of our listeners of you know i don't go to the news anymore the news comes to me right yeah so if you're not playing in all those that whole entire ecosystem, then you know you've got to you're taking a big risk. And there are some people who can do it successfully. And you know there's some there's a, a, a great uh, biotech site in Seattle uh, run by a guy named Luke Timmerman, and he's he does ninety nine dollar a year subscriptions, mm -hmm. and um, has built a successful one man business out of it. So there's there's different approaches, yeah. but for the most part, you've if you're going to be a, a, a a holistic publisher in this world, you've got to play in all this stuff. Hmm. 
Hmm. It's interesting because I was going to bring up one of the tech trends that identifies to me is sort of the, the corporate unbundling away from core competency, where you can decide to take a dependency on a different business for something that you're deciding is, is not the thing that is unique and differentiating to you. And so one yeah. one thing that I'll um, bring up here is Ben Thompson um, uh, has has a great theory. I was about wondering how long we would go in this episode <laughs> before we reference time to strategy in this episode is thirty two minutes. Um, I actually I don't know what market it'll be, but uh, he has a, a, a great theory about okay, I can be a one man independent publisher because I have this you know a very sustainable business model where people pay me directly, and um, I know that right. I'm not a destination site, so. Um, there, are, I need to run extremely lean because I only have you know this very specific business model that allows me to do that. And then on the other side of the continuum, you have the New York Times, and they can afford to do all things for all people because they have just all eyes on them. They're the first thing that people check. I mean, there there are very few of those who have survived the the Facebookization of the front door of the internet. And it, it's it's interesting to see like how publishers in the middle play with that. And I think, Todd, you, you raised a great point that you sort of have to embrace that, you know, it's it's the world around our publication. I, I just looked, pulled up our analytics to maybe shed some light on this. So about 45% of our inbound traffic is from organic search. About 22% is from social, uh, all forms of social. I'm sorry, 22% is from direct, and then about 18% is from social. Hmm. So you get a sense for you, We still have a pretty good direct oh, yeah. audience there. Wow. but there's That's actually but, crazy to me that that organic search is still by far the largest. It is, and I don't know. Um, that, that may speak to quirks of our audience yeah. or our site, but and I don't know that that's the case for everybody. And that does not include direct? That does not include wow. direct. Yeah, wow. that's organic search. That's that's the testament to the omnibar right there. I mean, I think yes. as much yeah. as we're yeah 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 good point. We're like people but don't Google know the is serving between... ads on the, wow. Well, it, Just go buy some Google shares right no, now. Nobody knows the difference. We do not dispense investment investment advice on this show. <laughs> <laughs> we should probably be legally bound to say that more often. But we, uh, you know, it's it's a it, most people don't know the difference between you know typing in words and typing in a URL. Yeah. Right. And so they're 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 I going to right. the internet. They're typing in the words, and if GeekWire is the first thing that comes up with the information about they're looking for, they hit it. Right. And you know, I. I uh, it's it's interesting only that well the, the interesting nuance there to me is that more people are being active about the news that they choose to learn about rather than reactive to whatever comes up in their Facebook feed. Right. I, don't, I don't think I was giving yeah. people enough credit. Yeah, <laughs> and like I said, we may not be representative of the the broader trends mm, out there. Yeah. There are some quirks in that's our audience. Still, that's fascinating. Yeah. Huh. Um, but you uh, it, would it be fair to say that? You guys at least have reimagined um, your product from being journalism to being a community, or, or, or like not journalism ways, is the wrong word, but it, from being a news site to yeah, being a community. Like, I'd say it's still at its core a news site, and that that's the thing. When you look at the drivers of the business, the you know doing quality news, trying to break news, that 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 really is your ultimate competitive advantage. And that gets to what you're talking about, Ben. It's like focus on your core competencies. You yep. know, developing a social network is not you know, my core competency. Mm-hmm. I was trained as a journalist and most of the folks at the, the company were. And so that, that really gets to what you're saying there. Yeah, and I think uh, I should just say, like, you guys do a really amazing job of yeah, that. Yeah, we, we should a- say, too. Yeah, we are both big fans. Oh, thanks. Uh, GeekWire is... I'm sure for all of our listeners in Seattle are already fans, um, but uh, for people who are not in Seattle, you probably also have heard of GeekWire, but it is a fantastic technology news site. Um, and, and, and a, I think, especially speaking at Madrona as a VC here in the Seattle community, just a linchpin of the whole technology community in the Northwest. Uh, Thanks. Um, well, and I should say, only 30% of our traffic is Washington State. So Washington oh, wow. State is our largest individual market, but it's not the majority of our traffic. It speaks to a couple things. First, there's intense interest in what's going on here from other parts of the world. Yeah. But we founded the site on the premise that Seattle and the Pacific Northwest deserve a national and international techno- technology news site of their own. And so, so the traffic kind of bears that out. And that's, mm-hmm. that's my stump speech. That's my elevator pitch. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Uh, I'll be on a future episode. I'll be on episode yeah. 150 of Acquired, the uh, the acquisition of GeekWire. <laughs> the acquisition of GeekWire. 
uh, Washington as as uh, largest single geography, but not a majority. You and acquired both. <laughs> there you go. Nice, <laughs> awesome, perfect. <laughs> We're basically the we could do we could do a merger now. <laughs> um, the, uh, we'll talk after. So we'll, we'll talk after. Yeah, that's not not on the on, not on the record. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and I, I, the other I, we've covered you know great tech themes here. The other one I wanted to bring up quickly is. Ben Thompson, um, his aggregation theory, uh, which we've talked about also on the show before, but basically is the theory that, you know, in the past, and it's, it's represented nowhere better than publishing and journalism, where in the past you needed to aggregate um, distribution. As, as a distributor, you needed to aggregate, you know, um, you needed to aggregate journalists and you needed to aggregate delivery routes of newspapers and all this, everything basically looking backwards from the customer. You didn't really care about the customer. The customer needed to come to you. In the internet world, you need to aggregate the customers and then all of the producers will come to you. And and this is what's happened with Facebook here with, with yeah. instant articles. Um, you know, they cater to the customers. They care about the user experience. They care about making it beautiful, which is why they acquired Push Pop Press, so that the customers come to them. Uh, or the customers are their customer, uh, the, the readers, um, and then the producers come to them, uh, which is, I just think, super, super interesting. No, that's great. That's I had, n- had never thought about it that way. That's, that's And it's true. It's completely true. And that's why Facebook has so much power. I mean, if you watch just the casual person pick up their phone, the chances that they're going to open the Facebook app first are so high. Incredible. They they decide what you're going to be entertained by, and that that is a tremendous sword to yield. Yeah, or and and yield. informed by, which is the whole issue that's come up recently with the the issue with the Facebook trending stories. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. thing. Should we touch on that a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, for listeners who haven't been been tracking, um, there was basically. You know, there there are mixed um, feelings about how true it is, but basically, not in the news feed itself, but in the little trending news widget on desktop in the top right, um, or on mobile when you tap into an empty search field, you see hand curated top news that um, Facebook thinks you would be interested in, and the news story um, that that. Um, basically alleges that they had talked to someone who used to work on that team and they said it was um, anti-conservative. And the blow-up from that has been unbelievable. And the the interesting takeaway is, boy, if the blow-up from that little thing has been that big, that little thing that you know half of you probably haven't even seen and most of you probably have never clicked on, people give Facebook a tremendous amount of credit for having this like agnostic algorithm. So can you imagine if they were doing anything in the, the newsfeed algorithm to, to tilt one way or another? I mean, they, they're, they're viewed as like this arbiter of the truth and there's this pure, clean algorithm that decides mm-hmm. what you look at. And I think that that trust that they've instilled in people is, is powerful. A, a crack itself. has emerged, though, in the past month. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Very, I think very, very dangerous for them. But it speaks to their power, and yep, it speaks yep. to that that whole flipping of yeah. you, know, you aggregate the users. Yep. You aggregate as long as users are coming every day to Facebook as a as a producer as a publisher. You you have to be there. Yeah, right. absolutely. And, and this gets right back to what we said last episode that their crown jewels are engagement, and it's it's engagement and time on site and just how much of your life you're giving to Facebook, and that's yep. the power that they they wield. And uh, interesting to contrast that with. Snapchat too from the last episode, which is, you know, they've said like, we're not gonna, we're not, you know, funky algorithms. We're not tracking you. We're not anything. We're like, you watch the stories you want to watch and you follow the people you, uh, you want to follow. And it's hard to discover things on Snapchat. Hmm. Um, hmm. Interesting. It is. All right. Uh, should we move on to conclusion grading? Yeah. Yeah, um, this this is an easy A for me. I mean, I think that like they they, they really couldn't have done any wrong. They, um, I don't think that this acquisition necessarily made it so that they were going to go this direction. I think that um, this is th- th- doing something like instant articles is a natural course, and it, it, they would have done it maybe just like slightly less beautifully. Mm-hmm. But I think um, you know, great people to pick up. They're, they they were great leaders at Facebook. Just talking mm-hmm. to friends that that worked with Mike, and um, I think that. Um, only, only good things. Yeah, I I agree. 
I'm just thinking. I, I think you're right, though. If they, if they hadn't acquired Push Pop Press, they would have done this anyway. It just would have been less beautiful. Um, so in that sense, it was probably really a great acquisition for them. I don't think they spent that much. I mean, we, know, we don't know, but they probably didn't. Um, yeah, I give it a. I give it an A too. I think what's holding me, what's nagging at me, is is there is an element of of creepiness to instant to, to Facebook as we were talking about this crack that's emerged. One and two, um, could there have been something um, bigger that Push Pop Press could have been? I don't know. This was a great buy for Facebook, no doubt. Do, do you mean within Facebook? No, I, not necessarily. I, I think we typically, to, to lay out the criteria for how we grade these, it's usually imagining that you are a shareholder of yeah. the, 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 the acquirer. acquirer. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what else they would have done within Facebook that would have been great. Um, so, yeah, hey, but I feel like Todd's got some. Well, what was the thing? Did you say it was paper that they worked on? What, uh, what was the yes. Uh, yes, inside paper. Facebook? Well, I mean, shouldn't that have been, if that had been like a runaway hit, then shouldn't have been an A? I don't know. Ah, I didn't have the plus. That, okay, yeah. <laughs> I got yeah. you. So I'll give it a B plus. I'll uh, reserve the right to move that to an A if they fix the damn plug in. Did I just get no. you guys a, uh, <laughs> Did I get you a uh, explicit language warning there just now? No, no, okay. no, no. Okay. We're, I can say damn. We're good. All right, good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And and uh, it's interesting that the only the only thing that I think could lower it. You're, you're raising an interesting point. Is is this a strategically good idea for Facebook? Like, should they yeah, be this, focusing this so hard uh, on on news and not just what you would discover that already lives on Facebook? Mm-hmm. I think it was brilliant strategically. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. the the whole notion that they become the platform and they host it, they serve it up. They're they're in control from Facebook Facebook's perspective. It's hard to see how it's bad. So if Facebook's goal is engagement and they want to keep you in the Facebook experience and ecosystem longer and they really want to be the internet to you, we've seen social, we've seen publishing, what's next? What else lives within mm-hmm. Facebook that's not currently within Facebook that will be the next instant articles? Mm-hmm. Well, well they, live that they're investing yeah. hugely in mm-hmm. television. Um, of course, they they did this with games for a while. It'd be interesting to see if that was you know reincarnated in a new way. Of course, virtual reality. Yep. With Oculus. Yep. Yeah, li- live is a whole other topic. Yeah. We've been experimenting with that too. It's totally ah, changed cool. the way we think about video. Oh, I'm curious. Really? Yeah. What? It, what so, uh... so we've been doing live streaming, um, and we we now have a debate every time: YouTube or Facebook? YouTube or Facebook? And mm. in the past month. The balance has shifted to Facebook because wow. you just see instant engagement. Have you guys tried Periscope or? We or tried that a little bit. Yeah, Periscope and. Um, have you tried Snapchat at all? No, no. Snapchat's one where we're not as advanced as we should be, honestly. Yeah. And that's part of the problem as a publisher. It's like, where do you put your resources? Yeah. And it's like the, there was that ad, the joke, where the two executives are going up the elevator and the two bike messengers are talking about some hot new social network. Sometimes it can feel like that. Like, yeah. And you never know exactly when to jump on board. Pinterest is another one where we have not gotten as much traction. Yeah. Mm. Um, but, but live. But Facebook live on live, Facebook has been big for you guys. It has. Now, we're not monetizing it yet. Um do, not directly. Is, is anyone? Do, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's an option at this point. No, um, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. you could you could hawk products while you're talking live on, uh, yeah. but that wouldn't be as part of a Facebook product. Yeah. And now Facebook's got the whole thing too, where uh, publishers can actually do sponsored content. So they sell the sponsored content, and they've got the in the Facebook business interface, they've got the little handshake icon. And so that's opened up new options too. So I long way of saying Facebook is finally starting to make it where it's financially at least worth exploring as a publisher versus just putting your stories on there and hoping that you get traffic back. Yeah. That, that's the big shift that we've seen. And, and did you see that? Uh, you mentioned that it's with live video, there's the debate between the two. Um, it, with pre-recorded video, are you seeing the same thing where you're, you're going, yeah, let's put it on Facebook and not on YouTube? No, we aren't. And okay. in part, that's because live is just such an interesting thing to do right now. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so we're still very much keyed into YouTube. Although, no, I take that back. We do. We're now posting it on both YouTube and Facebook after the fact. But the reason it's a debate 
an either or debate is because our equipment, some of our equipment, you can't simultaneously live broadcast uh, to both. Whereas you can obviously later upload to both. Yeah. Right. What uh, is there a particular um, event or live event that you've done that you think is like really example of of the future of yeah, so um, we've been doing tours. Uh, so, oh, in fact, cool. we did a tour of the Facebook headquarters here. It was kind of, it was very meta. Very. <laughs> and so and I joked to Mike Schrepfer, their CTO, I said, yeah, we're going to be trying this out on a little social network you might have heard. And he thought I was actually talking. He didn't get the joke. He thought I was talking about some <laughs> other, like, total paranoia. He thought we were, like, streaming it on something he'd never heard of. And I said, no, no, I'm, we're doing it on Facebook. We're, do, we're live streaming on yeah. the Lunch. <laughs> yeah. Um, but even just, you know, the quick stuff. You know, you've got your phone. Obviously, that's fully produced. We've got a handheld mic, and we're walking around with him, you know, streaming to a box that goes to Facebook. But just just the whole notion of being a reporter or being anybody out there, being able to pull out your phone and immediately broadcast to a giant audience. Now, of course, this has been around for a while with, you know, Ustream and those kinds of things. But right. it gets to your point. Facebook has the user base, and yep. so it changes everything. Yep, and it has your user base. That's right. Because it's, it's people, it, it, presumably people that are fans of GeekWire on Facebook see this right at the top of their news feed when you're live. Right, exactly. Hmm. So, yeah, it's it's changed the dynamic a lot now that it just seems like there's been a cascade of, of changes over hmm. the past year, basically. Yeah. Yeah, Facebook is investing heavily in all this stuff. They are. All right. Sh- should we uh, get to the carve-out? Let's do it. All right. Uh, Todd, you want to go first as our guest? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, my carve out is actually a, another podcast. So, Love it. All right. and, but it touches on themes that you all touch about. And so I'm going to be very specific here. Gimlet Media's startup podcast. Now, I'm sure a lot of people watch. Oh, listen, yeah. listen, here's what here's the dynamic that happened with this. A lot of people listened to the first season, which told the story of Alex Bloomberg, the former This American Life yep. rep- reporter, journalist, starting his own company, mm-hmm. uh, which was fantastic. And then season two kind of sucked, honestly. Yeah. They, 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 well, ex- didn't, didn't the dating ring shut down? Is, is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it was. A, it was it, I, I, personally, I personally didn't. I was not into that episode, that, that whole season. I, I, I suffered through it. Season three, if you got, if you got lost in season two, go back and start okay. again on season three. And I don't want to ruin it, but they do this great. They do a story where they 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 tell the how can I do this without ruining for everybody? They tell the story of a startup and its founding, and then do a reveal. And you they tell you at like I think it's at the end of the second episode what the startup is that they've been talking about, and it's one that it's one that everybody knows. Oh, and it's one cool. that you've you've featured on one of your episodes last oh, fall. Wow. You, you, oh. you'll as soon as you start hearing you'll let, be like oh yeah that's I know what company oh, that is but a lot of people this. out there won't know uh, like casual listeners not in the tech industry won't know which company they're talking about so anyway, that's my carve out startup uh, episode or startup season three the first couple episodes God I love I love the teaser I'm like as if that, that, <laughs> that's, I, yeah. I'm unspoiled this is great you're a good pitch man good good <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go next because it's it's somewhat related unless you have a, another podcast not is not yours audio audi- auditorially related mine, no mine are <laughs> no. the okay. words okay um, so I have my carve out for the week is uh, something to listen to your podcasts on super interesting I read this um article on back channel uh which is part of medium which is medium's um tech uh collection which is such um, a great i guess name. you will uh, channel. Back back channel. Name, yes yeah. <laughs> um and the title of the piece is called what if the future of technology is in your ear and it's about this um this bluetooth earpiece uh that uh fits in your ear it looks like a hearing aid you, you really can't it's you can buy it in a variety of skin tones and you can't tell it's there um and it's made by made in China by some Chinese company, and you can buy it for like eleven dollars on Amazon. Uh, I bought it for eleven dollars uh, when uh, the piece was written. It was thirteen dollars, uh, and it connects to your phone via Bluetooth, and and it, you can stream audio to it. You can stream music. You can stream podcasts. You can stream audiobooks. Um, you can talk to it uh, via Siri. And the whole the article is about like the device is you know kind of janky, like but but it's amazing for like eleven dollars. Um, and then you can like talk to Siri in your ear, and it's like it's like the movie Her, like exactly. It, it's that, and it's eleven dollars on Amazon. Um, the article is really good, um, and then the device, like it's I listen to all my podcasts and audiobooks on it now when I'm driving, when I'm walking, when wow. I'm it's just it's just in my ear, and nobody knows it's there. It's pretty cool. Wow, 
Just wait till series good, and then it'll be. Uh, yeah, right. We're, we're, <laughs> we're waiting on that. iOS 10, maybe. WWDC, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. um, mine is an article on Medium by Andy Dunn, the founder of Bonobos, or Bonobos, as I've, I've heard it both ways, called The Risk Not Taken. And it's this really great reflective piece uh, about different points in Andy's life, one when he was starting Bonobos um, and, and one event many years earlier, uh, really just about times when he's faced a difficult decision but already sort of knew the answer. And uh, he calls it the little, the little voice, a little, little something on his shoulder. And uh, it... It, it shows up and, and he looks over and he doesn't recognize it at first and then um, he realizes, oh, my decision's already made and I, I have to go do that thing. And it's a really interesting play out of the two different paths that you could go, taking the risk and not taking the risk. Mm-hmm. It's really poetically written, um, really, really smart guy and um, you know, re- really great for any readers who are sort of um, looking to try and figure out, should I take the risk, should I not take the risk or, or maybe perennially thinking about those things. So um, that is good. So, uh, what's the name of the article again? The risk not taken by okay. Andy Dunn, and uh, that'll be in our show notes or the the show description. You can hit the little little icon next to this episode and find the link. Uh, before great. we wrap up, can we? I, I think we need to uh, to talk about this for a minute the, at the meta level. We just did this episode about Facebook and instant articles and publishing, and uh, two of our three car well, all of our carve outs were media yeah. related, um, and uh, two of them were on Medium. <laughs> um, one was a podcast, and these are all new forms of journalism and publishing that um, are outside the bounds of Facebook, really, uh, and in a lot of ways. For uh, now, for now, for now. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting that, like, just when you think the um, just when you think the walls have closed around the garden, you know, there are flowers springing up outside. <laughs> wow! Speaking of poetic. <laughs> <laughs> all right, before we wrap up here. Todd, where can our listeners find you? Geekwire.com. It's that simple. And, awesome. Uh, I'm Todd Bishop on Facebook, on uh, Twitter. Also so, probably on Facebook. Uh, and on yeah, Facebook, yes. Yeah, <laughs> Big thank you to Todd. Uh, this has been awesome. Uh, uh, this is really exciting for me. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a loyal listener. I see the... Are you going to listen to this episode? I, uh, you know, I'll probably wait a month. <laughs> 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 that's, that's how I tend to do things. Nice. So, yeah. No, I, I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks yep. for coming. Who got the truth? Is it you, is it you, is it you who got the truth now? You are not yet schooled in the power of network effects, young Gilbert. (laughs) (laughs) I will cut that. Who got the truth? Is it you, is it you, is it you who got the truth now? Is it you, is it you, is it you? Sit me down, say it straight, another story on the Welcome to episode 14 of Acquired, the podcast where we talk about technology acquisitions that actually went well. I'm Ben Gilbert. I'm David Rosenthal. And we are your hosts. We have a very special episode for you today. I can't really think of a time when I didn't call it a very special episode. Every episode is special, Ben. It's true. Um, This episode is not necessarily about a technology acquisition that actually went well. Um, We have no idea how it went. Uh, It is huge and it is recent. Today, we are talking about LinkedIn being acquired by Microsoft two days ago uh, at the time of uh, the time of recording and um, super speculative. But I think the whole Internet is sort of a buzz with, you know, what's the deal with this this acquisition? Why did they do it? You know, what's the future hold? And I think it's going to be super interesting to speculate a little bit and um, throw out some possible paths and and, uh, draw some conclusions yeah we're gonna have some fun with this we i don't think we've ever gotten as many requests on slack and no email and other channels for no please talk about linkedin so yeah. here we are and in fact i think um this may change the timbre of what this show is about i think for the you know at some point here we might rename this to just a show about tech acquisitions because we're doing things that didn't go well things that yeah, didn't go right. well um really inter- anything that's got a good story so we love stories here. We do. 
All right, listeners, our sponsor is one of our favorite companies, Vanta, and we have something very new from them to share. Of course, you know Vanta enables companies to generate more revenue by getting their compliance certifications. That's SOC 2, ISO 27001. But the thing that we want to share now is Vanta has grown to become the best security compliance platform as you hit hypergrowth and scale into a larger enterprise. It's kind of wild. When we first started working with Vanta and met Christina, my gosh, have they had like a couple hundred customers, maybe. Now they've got 5,000, some of the largest companies out there. It's awesome. Yeah, and they offer a tremendous amount of customization now for more complex security needs. So if you're a larger company and in the past you showed Vanta to your compliance department, you might have heard something like, oh, well, we've already got a compliance process in place and we can't integrate this new thing. But now, even if you already have a SOC 2, Vanta makes maintaining your compliance even more efficient and robust. They launched Vendor Risk Management. This allows your company to quickly understand the security posture of the vendors that you're choosing in a standardized way that cuts down on security review times. This is great. And then on the customization front, they now also enable custom frameworks built around your controls and policies. Of course, that's in addition to the fact that with Vanta, you don't just become compliant once, you stay compliant with real-time data pulled from all of your systems, now all of your partners' systems, and you get a trust report page to prove it to your customers. If you click the link in the show notes here or go to vanta.com slash acquired, you can get a free trial. And if you decide you love it, you will also get $1,000 off when you become a paying customer make sure you go to vanta.com slash acquired. Um, A little bit of uh, administrative before we dive in. Um, As usual, I'm going to ask, please review us on iTunes. It makes a huge difference, and it's what makes the show grow and tick. Um, Share it on Twitter, Facebook, or even LinkedIn. Um, (laughs) uh, uh, Please share it on Microsoft LinkedIn whenever you can. Um, uh, for those of you who, uh, we're, we, we get some questions, you know, I don't have, uh, I'm not listening on iTunes or I don't have an Apple device. Um, we're going to post this on product hunt. So, uh, search for it on, on product hunt. We would love, uh, love an upvote there. Yes, please. Thank you as always. And, uh, and feel free to join the Slack group. It's really, uh, it's really awesome interacting with all you guys. We've got over a hundred people now and yeah, great discussion going on. So, um, if you want to, if you want to spend more time with Ben and David, join the Slack group. Yeah. We, uh, we want to do a little bit of follow-up. Um, there's been some news from our last couple episodes that uh, we think are worth talking about for a, a minute here. Um, David, yeah, you want to talk, talk about Snapchat? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to add a... Uh, sometimes we'll have this, sometimes we won't, but a, adding a section to the show on follow-ups on previous shows. So uh, we'll, we'll do this quickly. But first, um, from Snapchat, a uh, big announcement uh, this week as well. Uh, ben Thompson, our, our favorite, uh, our favorite Oracle uh, here on Acquired, uh, <laughs> <laughs> tweeted that um, uh, the the LinkedIn acquisition and WWDC were the second and third most important announcements of the week, <laughs> and that Snapchat launching their advertising API was the most important announcement of the week. Well, time will tell on that. Yeah, I think all we have right now is a, a press release to go off of, and it'll be super interesting to see uh, how advertisers and, and brands adopt that. Yeah, big uh, big profile in Adweek, though, um, talking about the launch of this API uh, and, um, and, and profiling the company. Worth reading. We'll link to it in the show notes. Um, and then the second follow-up we wanted to do is actually on instant articles as well. Ben had a fun experience this week. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, actually not sure if this is uh, an announced product or, or even maybe just like a relabeling of an existing one. But I, I tapped on what looked like a Facebook instant article this week, and uh, it expanded into a native ad unit. And um, it was something that was a super sleek experience to just, it had my email autofilled, my phone number autofilled, and it was a way for me to kind of join a, a waiting list for an upcoming product. And I'm, I think Facebook has always had this direct response capture type type ad unit, but it's really interesting to see them potentially expanding that um, that instant articles or, or instant ads umbrella to include these other things and having a real sleek experience with it. Yeah, so. and it's cool with both of these that, um, you know, the ad products and ad product teams don't get a lot of uh, airtime in tech uh, with companies, but um, especially, you know, social networks and tech companies, but um, really cool product innovations on, on both of these fronts. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. With that, want to dive in, let's dive in acquisition history and facts. So 
LinkedIn. I assume almost everybody listening to this episode is a member of LinkedIn, but um, let's go back to when it was started. If not, I'd like to invite you to join my professional network on LinkedIn. (laughs) (laughs) Spam your address books. Uh, We'll get to that. Okay, so um, LinkedIn, I think, I could be wrong on this, but I think was the very first... um, uh, spin out, uh, not spin out, but um, progeny of the PayPal Mafia. Mm, um, 2003? 2002. Right? So uh, PayPal was acquired, uh, as we talked about several times ago, um, was acquired by eBay in July of 2002. And in December, December 14th of 2002, to be exact, less than six months later, uh, several former PayPalers, uh, led by Reed Hoffman, uh, band together and they form a new company and they call it LinkedIn. Um, and they, uh, so they start in December and then they work really quickly and they launched an, launch an MVP very quickly. Uh, especially again, this is like pre AWS time. Um, they launch an MVP in May of 2003 and it is a social network and social networks are hot then. The, yeah, I think, uh, I remember reading the Facebook effect by David Kirkpatrick and in that book, he kind of talks about that there was a group of people that were in Silicon Valley that were super involved in a lot of tech products and realized that social networking was going to be the next big thing. And that, you know, this was totally under, it it explains their fast time to market because I think that, um, you know, with with Friendster right around then. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's a a group of ex-PayPalers and other kind of close people that were like, you know, technology is finally in the right place right now where this is about to be huge and let's let's get to it. Yeah, and it's it's really cool that like there was this um, uh, in in Silicon Valley, this kind of like uh, swelling of interest and um and building of of social networks uh and you know facebook hadn't even been started yet uh mm-hmm. but friendster was a super hot company um they'd uh, they just ra- they just they had raised money from uh benchmark and somebody else i can't remember but we're darling of silicon valley um uh, myspace was and, growing quickly and reed hoffman and mark pincus both put money into friendster if i recall i think that's right i think that's right yeah. Um, anyway, so they start, they launch in May of 2003 and um, they have a really interesting, um, interesting sort of bootstrapping mechanic for the network uh, to get, uh, you know, how do you start a, a network from a cold start? And that was the infamous and uh, product of a lawsuit later on, as, as is a recurring theme on our show, um, the infamous scrape your address book and spam all of your all of your everybody in your email address book yeah and in a very funny kind of uh, super foreshadowing or foreshadow-esque way um kind of reminds me of microsoft i mean they did this thing that was um you know sort of sneaky and maybe would earn them a lawsuit and they sort of just did it knowing that the upside from doing this thing you know it would it would it would be huge and it would be something where they would have to pay the price later they got sued i think it was a hundred million dollar suit later on for yep. for this but um you know once they had the network right they had then that you wouldn't have the network you know and it's this is like a total recurring theme in network driven technology companies like you know doesn't get talked a lot about these days but it's on the internet like airbnb totally did this you know off of craigslist to bootstrap their supply network to start and many many other networks have done the same thing and do you know about microsoft's like price per core thing we were talked about this on the show i don't think so price per cpu they basically put it when they were originally selling windows or maybe it was dos real early on they were um they had it in their sales contracts that they would make money for one copy of windows per core shipped by someone who entered an agreement with Microsoft to sell Windows at all. So they basically squashed the competition because manufacturers realized, oh, well, I'm paying for a copy of Windows whether I put it on here or not, so I may as well ship Windows. And by the time, you know, they they got sued for that, and and I think actually the the Justice Department forced them to pull that out of their their contracts. Um, By the time that came around, they, you know, had already squashed the competition and were yeah. totally way out ahead. It's totally, you know, when you're facing a cold start pro- uh, problem as a network, you know, the chicken and egg problem, like 
you can't you know you got to have something to, to some unfair advantage to get through it you know doesn't always have to be illegal but uh in many cases <laughs> it turns out it was yeah. um so uh late by late 2003 the network is starting to take off a little bit it's still really early um they raise a series a from sequoia uh, four point seven million dollars, uh, which was a lot of money back in that day, especially after the internet bubble uh, had burst. Um, and uh, Mark Kwame joins the board. Uh, later, when he left uh, Sequoia, um, Mike Moritz uh, takes over and is still to this day, I believe, on the board of LinkedIn. And Mark Kwame uh, is now in in Columbus, Ohio, running yeah. Drive Capital. Exactly, Ben's hometown. Columbus, shout out, shout out. Um. And uh, and so things continue to go well. And in 2004, the next year, they raised their Series B from Greylock. And super cool. Uh, about two, I think about two years ago, um, much like uh, in, when we talked about with YouTube and through the lawsuit um, of YouTube, we were able to see Sequoia's investment memo about that. Uh, two years ago, Reed Hoffman open sourced quote unquote uh, his pitch deck for for his series B at Greylock mm-hmm. and it's this great document we'll link we'll link to it in the show notes but he has the whole slightly edited uh, pitch deck that he used for LinkedIn series B um, and then he has commentary on it and and he's like very self-critical you know it's like this was you know obviously this worked but like it made a bunch of mistakes and like I was really nervous about these things and trying to cover up like we had no revenue everybody was like the elephant in the room was like why the heck do you guys not have revenue and like I was like really nervous about that huh. um, cool document so um, in the pitch deck you know he he kind of the the LinkedIn positions uh, they position it as like the the unbiased sort of you know ground source of source of truth about professionals um, and talk about how with all the existing ways of finding professionals in the world at that time like it was mostly kind of directory based and all these incentive problems and people were incentivized to make themselves look good or to um, you know be founder to do sales leads and there was nothing you know and they thought that a network could solve all of these incentive problems and create true, um, you know, for the first time, true uh, information publicly available on the internet about professionals and where they are and how to find them. And turns out they were right. <laughs> um, as we talk about this acquisition, you know, LinkedIn has never been primarily an advertising based uh, network. They, they've uh, advertising based business. They've had uh, ads as part of their business line, but most of their revenue comes from monetizing recruiters. Um, and so as people have been commenting about this acquisition, you hear lots of talk about like, oh, you know, LinkedIn doesn't have a lot of engaged users and I spend no time on the site and it looks like crap. Um, but you can't really judge this company in the same way that you judge Facebook or Twitter because it's not how they monetize. No. And, and Josh Elman has a great post that uh, I'll, I'll put in the show notes too. Josh is a, uh, he was at LinkedIn. Um, he's, he's been at a bunch of great companies and he's at, at Greylock now. And he has a great post talking about, you know, you can't look at this like, you know, are, is, you know, are the users of LinkedIn really like X multiple more valuable? They're not that engaged. I mean, at, at the end of the day, they are able to monetize those users in a very different way because they sell an extremely uh, a high value product, which is yep. browse and access to these people. Yep. And um, and it, it's interesting later, we'll, we'll get in a minute to uh, LinkedIn's IPO, but actually in the IPO prospectus, they list in the risk factors, uh, quote, a substantial majority of members do not visit the website on a monthly basis. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny when you compare them to you know many of the other businesses that we've looked at on this show. Um, but again, it's not they don't make money when you visit the website. They make money from having your data, uh, up to date professional data about you on the system, and and you being found. So so they build these bus- these business lines over time. But there there are three that LinkedIn has, um, and the first is what they call talent solutions, and that's about sixty percent of their revenue, um, and that is for recruiters. Um, and it's super, as Ben was talking about, I mean, this is a super expensive product that they sell to recruiters. The full product is $900 a month yeah. uh, per seat. And I think that the cheapest way to go to LinkedIn premium is like 600 bucks a year. It's a, it's a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. About 1200 a year. Yeah. It's, it, 
So think about that every time somebody contacts you and has the little uh, yellow in thing there. But as like, you know, they've completely, they have just knocked it out of the park and executing on this. Like if you are a recruiter operating in the HR world today, you need to have, you know, LinkedIn recruiter. Like it's just, there's, it's like a joke if you don't. Right, right. And, and, uh, you know, (laughs) like let's imagine that you're a company and you haven't purchased this for your recruiting department you're not going to be able to hire any recruiters because they're, you know, they're going to be hamstrung from day one. Yep. So they've created this just incredible expectation in the market that that is a table, table stakes tool to have. Table stakes. Um, and they've captured a ton of value in that market. Um, so then the other two business lines they have, they have other, the second one they call marketing solutions. And that is primarily ads um, that they show in various forms uh, on the site, um, whether it's sponsored in mail or, or, all sorts of things. And then the third one is premium subscription. So this is um, what they've spent a lot of time on over the last few years. Um, and that's monetizing um, monetizing members of LinkedIn who are not recruiters. Oh, so okay, you're separating. So LinkedIn premium is separate from their recruiting tools. Yes. And LinkedIn premium, uh, they're different flavors of it, um, but gives you access uh, to broaden out beyond your second degree network um, on LinkedIn. And that's great. Like is I mean, I use it all the time. I mean, is a is basically this tool was meant for venture capitalists, I think, <laughs> <laughs> and business development folks and sales folks, um, right. and uh, and that's about twenty percent of their revenue too. So, so um, and and that's about is it three billion a year in revenue? I think uh, total. Yeah, yeah. I I think that I actually did not look that up. Um, shut up. Yeah, I, I think that's about right. Um, and and that's a, a about one hundred and six million users. 106 million active users, uh, oh. just about 400 million registered users on the site. Oh, interesting. Uh, which is very interesting. So, um, so they continue. They execute super well uh, on on this as as a private company. Um, and and the sort of biggest event that they have before they go public is in 2000. Um, I believe it was 2007. Yep, uh, Reed actually steps aside as CEO. And they bring in an outside CEO to be uh, to run the company. Reed stays at the company day to day. A guy named Dan Nye. Um, so this isn't actually talked about uh, much. He d- he didn't stay very long. He he was there less than two years. He came from Intuit, and then he was at Advent Software. Um, he went on to become CEO of Rocket Lawyer, um, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, which reminds me, a total. I found this doing research for the show. An aside, but really kind of hilarious. Um, when they raised their Series C, uh, which they did in uh, in January of 2007, right before this happens, um, they they raised Bessemer led it, but they also had this other firm that I hadn't heard of uh, in there called the European Founders Fund. And I was like, "What's the European Founders Fund?" And I looked it up, and it's the Samvar Brothers. Wait, we've talked about them before, right? They're, these are the the guys that run Rocket Internet. Rocket Lawyer made uh... me think of it. Um, cool. in uh, in Europe that you know copycat <laughs> all the U.S. businesses, and I was like, this is just too funny. The Sandbar Brothers had a venture capital firm. I don't know if it still exists. Called European Founders Fund. So they're just copying wow. Founders Fund. Wow! wow. <laughs> just like they do with many other businesses. Hey, so, if it ain't broke, hey, fix it. hey, man, it works for them. Um, so uh, I was I just saw that and I was like, that is too funny. Um. So, uh, Dan doesn't last very long as CEO, but in December of 2008, uh, they, uh, bring in Jeff Weiner, and he is still today the CEO of, uh, of LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, and so, and even will be inside Microsoft. Exactly. Yeah. And they will remain so within Microsoft. Um, in January of 2011, uh, the company finally fil- files for an IPO. They go public in May of 2011. Um, they price uh, they price the IPO at forty five dollars a share. It trades up to ninety four dollars and twenty five cents by the end of the first day of trading. Wow. Um, and this was like I remember this was like a watershed moment at the time. They were the first like sort of new wave you know internet company, big internet company to go public. Um, after the sort of mid 2000s um and it was shortly thereafter that you know, facebook went public um that uh pandora went public that twitter went public um so this was a this was a big moment and that everybody kind of realized that these social networks that you know were still 
you know, people were like, how does Facebook make money? You know, well, even though Facebook makes money in a very different fashion from LinkedIn. Um, but when they, when LinkedIn, you know, filed their prospectus for the IPO, people were like, man, this business is going to do like 50 million in EBITDA this year. Um, so it was, it was a big moment. Um, and, uh, and so, and then the stock, uh, continued to do really well for over the five ish years that it was public, uh, up into going up into the, you know, two hundreds and, and above. Yeah. Till what? Feb- February of this year. Until, until February 5th, 2016, just a few months ago was, uh, on a Friday, uh, both LinkedIn and Tableau announced, uh, fourth quarter 2015, um, uh, results and uh, and expectations for the year to to wall street and it was like it was like black friday for software companies <laughs> yeah and it actually it, it killed the um the private company valuation and some of the market cap of of other SaaS companies yeah. and it it felt like it was super sensationalized and not well understood by the market yeah because what linkedin so LinkedIn announced earnings. They actually beat expectations on earnings for the fourth quarter of 2015, mm-hmm. but they announced lower than Wall than guidance that was lower than Wall Street expected for 2016, and the stock got hammered. It was down 43.6 percent in a single day. Uh, Ten billion dollars of market cap just wiped out of LinkedIn. Yeah, I mean they basically were signaling that we are hitting the top of our S curve. And that you you can't count on this continued growth in the future, which had been priced into their stock. Yeah, yeah. And so I think you know while that core business was still strong, they they were looking for secondary revenue channels. With they they had a display ads business that they had shut down a little bit earlier, or at least moved resources away from. And then there was a second product. Um, do you remember what that was called? That that was it was a uh, uh, lead um... sales navigator. Well, sales navigator they still have okay. I'm working on, but the growth the, the they expected huge growth in sales navigator and it's been slower to materialize. We'll get into this. Um, but um, but you know at at one point LinkedIn had a had a market cap of over fifty billion dollars, um, and uh, and between that and then and then following um, was just a you know it fell off a cliff in terms of the stock price. Um, on that same day, similar thing happened to Tableau, um, which is a great software company here in Seattle. Um, and because of those two, um, those two, uh, the, 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 those two companies, you know, announcing weaker than expected earnings, the whole SaaS sector, public SaaS companies just took a big hit. So like on that, on the same day on Friday, New Relic down 23%, Zendesk down 20%, HubSpot down 20%, Workday down 16%, NetSuite 15 Click 14 Demandware, which ends up getting acquired by Salesforce last week, two weeks ago, um, is down 13%. Salesforce itself was down 13%. It was just carnage. Yeah. Also, nice research. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Internet. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, um, and and so then uh for the last couple of months the the share price of of linkedin has crept back up but nowhere near the highs where it once was and then 2 days ago monday uh in like what was got to be one of the best kept secrets of major M&A of all time um microsoft announces that they are acquiring the company for 196 dollars per share um which comes to which comes to twenty six point two billion dollars total, um, which is a lot of money, well, but but not, but half of what LinkedIn was worth, you know, a year ago. Yeah, I mean, it, the thing that I wasn't thinking about in February when it's like there's two parts to arriving at this conclusion, and I feel like within that first week, I, I sort of understood like, oh, these companies are sort of undervalued right now because they took this huge hit and you know their their core business remained strong it was just that a new business that proposed that promised huge growth didn't quite materialize like they're still doing 3 billion in revenue a year and the thing that didn't occur to me at that time is okay these guys are on sale and that doesn't yeah. mean on sale just to go buy the stock that means like they're massively at a discount for somebody to acquire them and what you got to start thinking then is like, who are key acquirers yep. where LinkedIn could be a massive asset and amplified by their existing yeah. core business. So so our job today uh, is to speculate uh, and think about <laughs> was, was, man, was this good? Was this a good move for, for Microsoft, for LinkedIn, 
or shareholders we'll we'll find out um well, but I, I feel like we can't we can't dive into it just yet without mentioning a super important piece of context here which is that um about a year ago a little over a year ago there were tons of rumors swirling in the market that microsoft was had made an offer to acquire salesforce yeah and i think i think it was all but confirmed like that 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 was yeah. actually you know came to the 11th hour and then fell through so the 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 rumors and these are just rumors we won't know maybe we could do a, sh- a show on this at some point but yeah, um fun. that would be fun um the rumors were that microsoft offered somewhere between 50 and 55 billion dollars to acquire salesforce mm-hmm. uh, a little over a year ago and salesforce was willing to talk but they wanted 70 and uh and microsoft walked away from that so Super important. And, and that played out in the press over weeks. Um, and that it, it, the, two things with this, both that this was completely kept quiet. Yeah. And the, the, the LOI, I think, was signed a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Jeff Weiner in his memo to LinkedIn employees mentions that, you know, the senior management team at LinkedIn has had, quote, months to digest this. Um, yeah. which is pretty amazing. And apparently it all started after after February 5th. Which says to me at Microsoft that not a lot of people knew. I mean that this was this was something that was bored. Satya, key executives, actually, a uh, friend of the show, Kurt Delbeni, is uh, very much involved in, in yeah. you know orchestrating how these two companies will will come together. Kurt, who we were lucky enough to have on for our Accompli and Wonderlist episode, uh, is um, going to be leading the the uh, integration uh, for Microsoft. Yeah, and actually, the press release talks about how he's going to be doing that with. Um, Scott Guthrie, who leads Enterprise, which includes both Azure and Dynamics CRM product, and Chi Lu, which um, Chi, Chi's purview is uh, mostly kind of productivity, so the whole office suite and Bing. And so I think there's a little bit of clue there as to what they're going to do with it, probably in office, and then some combination of, of Azure and fueling the Dynamics product. Yeah. So, well, let's jump into um, acquisition category, because I feel like this will start to start to unpack this here. What's yeah. your what's your early categorization here? Yeah, so I mean, I think there's a business line from acquiring the the you know um, current revenue stream, um, but in my mind, you know, you don't buy this product just to um, cash flow it. Like they're they're not buying that business line because it's it's going to pay itself back and you know, short order and we feel good about owning this new revenue stream. It's an integration play. So I'm, I'm calling this a product acquisition since it's a product that they're going to um, amplify the current sales of with their, their own kind of channel and, and integrations and then make their own products uh, better and um, kind of define the future of, of identity. So I would say it's a, a, a product acquisition to be combined with their existing products. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to take a, a, a similar route. Um... But I think this is really key. So, for, so for me, I said yes, product acquisition. Um, but it's a product acquisition that at least has the potential, I think, to transform and evolve an entire business line for for Microsoft. So clearly, this is—I uh, mean, I, I don't know—but I would imagine this is going to be within Microsoft's business process, uh, productivity, and business processes segment, um, which is one of the new segments that um, uh, Satya streamlined the company into when when he took over. Um, and uh, and and I think you know there's so many ways angles to think about LinkedIn, but one of them that you have to imagine people at Microsoft are thinking about is as a as a data set and a data acquisition and the ability to both operate link continue to operate LinkedIn as the set of products that it is within that segment, but then infuse that data into into office into active directory into dynamics into all of the you know the sort of mobile first cloud first you know world that microsoft you know lives in now um all of the business um tools that they have uh you you have to imagine is something they're thinking about yeah totally and that's a really good lead in i I sort of have like four buckets of of why i think they they pulled the trigger on this one and that first one, you know, you just nailed is, is integration with Office 365 to extend identity outside the company. In the world of, of Microsoft, of your, they, uh, they have Active Directory. Um, and Which we might want to say a word about that because I, I bet a lot of our listeners have no idea what Active yeah, Directory great is. Yeah, great point. Um, so basically, Microsoft's lock-in and the enterprise comes from the fact that they own identity and everything that stems from that. 
So everything works seamlessly with with their you know or historically works seamlessly across all their products because everything is is you know plugs into Exchange and uses Active Directory to manage identity and it's it's you know the rock solid truth of who you are that everything in the company can plug into. Yep. So when you as a employee at a company that uses the Microsoft productivity suite, you know, you sign in to your Microsoft account and then that give, grants you access to your email, to Office 365, to whatever enterprise app if you in, in fact use even Windows, you're, for you're, the few people out there who use Dynamics, you know, into Dynamics uh right. and uh and and even Windows. Yep. You you can think of it as like deeply deeply integrated to single sign-on. And the nature of companies has changed and I think that 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 we'll, we'll talk about trends in a little bit, but I think that a big tech trend or really a big like world trend that's happened is people move around a lot. I mean, people stay at companies for 18 to 30 months and there's a lot of bouncing around and people collect knowledge from all the different companies they were at and build reputation from all the different companies that they were at. And a world that is entirely centered around, you know, who you are at this company is kind of antiquated. Yeah, and this is such a good point. Co- company, the company doesn't own your identity anymore. You own your identity and you lend your skills and reputation to the company while you're there. And some people do that yep. for a really long time, but some people don't. And you have to have a way to be able to access and leverage all that other data. Yep. And, um, you know, for Microsoft previously, which is, again, trying to reinvent everything it's doing, uh, as, as Kurt talked to us about a few months ago, you know, in this, you know, mobile first, cloud first world, like when the reality is that the, majority of employees at least in fields like tech or finance um you know aren't staying in the same job for long periods of time anymore if you as microsoft only have these very siloed views into people and not the the holistic view of their skills and their career history and their identity you know across jobs uh you know there we go hence linkedin yeah and the the parallel i think i should uh, that i wrote down anyways you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, we had this like IT shakeup where they were freaking out about BYOD, bring your own device. And this is the realization of BYOD when it comes to identity. Yeah. BYOE, bring your own employee. <laughs> BYOP, your own person. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and you mentioned, um, well, I was going to go into the sort of second thing because I think there's a good segue there. Um, the second reason, we kind of talked uh, about um, identity in Office 365 there. I think that it, as it extends to dynamic CRM, it's hugely valuable to know an entire person's work history when you are trying to sell something to them. Yeah. So uh, imagining, you know, that the problem with Microsoft's worldview before is this is John Smith and he was at company A. There is also a John Smith at company B. We don't know if those are related. And and you know, I'm sure there's like attempts to make sure they're related, but the magical thing that LinkedIn nailed is all the incentives are aligned for them to make money off of you wanting to make all of your information accurate. And so if you can have this like holistic view of identity when it comes to customers, that's incredibly valuable also. Yep. The I agree. And I, I want to jump into with something I've been thinking about is with regards to this acquisition. Uh, and Ben and I were texting about this earlier. The way I think about LinkedIn is like, it's such a canonical example of like the power of a network effect mm. and the value of the asset of LinkedIn's network that they've built. And and I'll get into this in a, in a little bit in, in tech themes. Um, but if you take for a given for the moment that the, uh, the network effect uh, and the, the defensibility of that means that their professional network that they built basically can, you know, never or almost never be disrupted. And Lord knows many people have tried over the years, despite the product being really crappy and all these other things. Um, you know, what can you build on top of that? And, and we talked about how LinkedIn isn't doesn't monetize via ads, really. You know, they're sort of like they they did recruiting first. That was the most obvious. They nailed it. Like they own that industry. Um, but then it's also really obvious, like they should do like sales and biz dev and partnerships and like, you know, like what I use LinkedIn for, um, and probably many, many of our, of our listeners. Um, and they kind of really dropped the ball there. Um, and then you think about like, man, could Microsoft with the LinkedIn network asset on top of that, like really execute where LinkedIn hasn't, I think there's a big opportunity there. 
Yeah, and uh, Ben Thompson agrees with you. I, I pulled this quote. It, it's getting to be not a question of if, but how many times we'll mention Ben's prolific writing on the show. But uh, he has a quote in the Stratechery article about this. This is, I do believe upside is magnified significantly by Microsoft. Should LinkedIn Sales Navigator, for example, sell into 100% of Microsoft Dynamic CRM user base, a good portion of this deal would be paid for. And that's just really interesting to think about. Is yeah. it, you, you, you raise a good point. The, the crux of the whole thing is, can Microsoft leverage the network asset that link that LinkedIn has created better than they themselves have? Yeah, and and, and it's it. worth a word on like on Sales Navigator. So this is this product that LinkedIn has put a ton of effort into, and this is their attempt to execute and capture this sort of second pillar of value on top of the network with with sales um, and and lead generation. And the problem they've had is that like sales runs on the CRM. This is why Salesforce is such a valuable company. And unless you're directly plugged into the CRM, like it's really hard to, you know, add a ton of value. And, and they've done a lot of integrations and, you know, Sales Navigator has had integration with Salesforce and with all the other CRMs out there. But like, it's really hard to do that. And, and for Microsoft, like A, they can plug it directly into Dynamics, which has very small market share, but they also have the weight and through all the rest of the productivity suite, including email, the most important app for sales and many other, uh, many other, you know, professional you know, functions, um, and to be able to plug all of LinkedIn's network asset into that like huge opportunity. Yeah. And for everybody out there that listens to, um, or that works at a, a company that sells to businesses, Salesforce has become kind of the operating system of the B2B company. And if a product doesn't plug into Salesforce, you're not using it because that's the central repository for how all the different departments of your company um, communicate with each other and, and it is the ground source of truth. So, I mean, that Microsoft has always been the we power productivity and we enable enterprises to be you know, the most productive and uh, efficient they can with the use of technology or through the use of technology. And that's been their their mission for a long time, or at least one of their missions. And to see Salesforce really like etching away at that, it, it, it's almost like to defend that turf, they had to do this. Yeah, I, I want to let Ben get to his, uh, his other two points, but I, I want to add in really quickly, like, yeah. I have to imagine, so what's also really cool about this acquisition is, as is the theme on this show, we'll get to find out all the nitty gritty of how it happened when the SEC filings come out, when the, when the deal closes. Which, uh, which they said is, is this year, which likely means late December. Yeah. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that because I have to imagine that if there, there was, there must have been at least one other bidder here, or the price wouldn't have gone this high, if not multiple others. But I got to imagine the other bidder was Salesforce. Has to be, and this is this is awesome. This is leading right into point three for me. Um, somebody else was going to buy them. Like that, they are on sale. There's only one LinkedIn. Like the magic of network effects makes it so that you know they were the source of truth for who, where an employer has been and what they've done and what they're good at even though their skills and endorsements thing is a little bit of a joke, they there was only one. So you couldn't go out and buy the other LinkedIn or build the other LinkedIn. It was like there was this one super valuable asset. And that's sort of an interesting M&A trend be, because of the you know network effects and technology today. Um, it, it makes them immensely more valuable and it creates these... these abs- There's certainly a bidding war here. So... When you're considering the value of this and you're Microsoft and um, you get approached by the investment banker that sort of put this together and said, hey, what do you think about this? Um, Which I I believe was Frank Quattrone. Uh, uh, again, we get, we'll, we'll fact check this. but um, let, Let's see. I know LinkedIn was advised by Catalyst. Yeah, Catalyst, Frank, Frank yeah. Quattrone. Who, cool. And Microsoft is, by Morgan Stanley. Yeah. Um, you got to be thinking with the hat not of, boy, is this worth you know, $25, $26 million, but more with the hat of what is the opportunity cost of it going to someone else and what's the capital outlay that we need to make in order to not have our lunch eaten. And it, it taking a step back from that, it's sort of interesting companies more so these days than ever have to look at M&A as a competitive threat and have the means, the borrowing means or the cash on hand means to do what they need to to defend their turf against a, a massive landscape shift like this. Yeah, I mean, like, 
uh, let's just take as an example, um, what if Twitter had acquired Instagram? I mean, I remember when like early days of Instagram, like my primary use case for it was posting pictures to Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you totally could have seen the rationale for that to happen. Yeah. Um, like how awful would that be for Facebook right now? Yeah, not good. Not good. The, the other interesting thing that I, I, I sort of danced into here a little bit is um, Microsoft did not pay for this in cash. And, and we haven't, this is often the case. Uh, but, well, they, they did, but they didn't even. So, well, right, right. They did not pay for it in the cash that they carry on their balance sheet. They took out you know, a, a large amount of debt because 94% of their assets are held their overseas. Cash, yeah. I'm sorry, their cash is held overseas. And, you know, with the 40-ish percent um, tax that they would have on, on bringing that back um, home. Repatriating the cash. Yeah, this is a huge problem for um, all companies uh, that are multinationals and are headquartered in the U.S., but tech companies especially have yeah. a big problem with repatriating their cash. So what So what they did, um, this was not a stock deal. It was all cash uh, consideration that LinkedIn shareholders are receiving, um, but they uh, Microsoft took out debt to, to finance the transaction. Yeah. And I think not entirely. They took out like, it's, it's not, you know, $26 billion of debt, but there, it was a, a large part of the yep. financing the transaction. So, um, yeah, you know, I think that, that getting back to David's point, it's like th- there was one single huge asset with network effects here. And the question is, can Microsoft, you know, squeeze more revenue out of it than LinkedIn was doing themselves? I mean, uh, will they is, uh, we will see. Uh, Can they? Answer is, in my mind, 100% yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then getting into my fourth point, this one's a little bit more broad. But um, so Microsoft has, you know, admitted that that Windows is not the future that they are not the Windows company going forward. They, of course, they, you know, large amount of people working on Windows, huge revenue stream, but its its operating systems are not the solo cash cow that they once were. And I shouldn't even say operating systems. Windows is not. And so in moving to this mobile-first, cloud-first company and focusing on, um, you know, their, their cloud offering, as you look up and down the cloud stack, they have infrastructure as a service and platform as a service with Azure. They have software as a service with Office 365. And you could look at this like, okay, they're becoming the cloud services company. So um, a, a business tools for recruiters mm-hmm. and, and more broadly for sales and marketing also is a cloud offering that they can add to that stack of yep. services they provide. And yep. so I, th- I think like you put on your old Microsoft hat, you're like, what? are they doing and like they typically squander large m a so this is terrible it's not going to go well you put on- talk to a bunch of current and former microsoft employees about this and that that is the most common reaction I, I would say yeah yeah this is a great time to tell you about one of our very favorite companies crusoe so crusoe as listeners know by now is a clean compute cloud provider specifically built for ai workloads NVIDIA is one of their major partners, and literally Crusoe's data centers are nothing but racks and racks of A100s and H100s. And because Crusoe's cloud is purpose-built for AI and run on wasted, stranded, or clean energy, they can provide significantly better performance per dollar than traditional cloud providers. Yes, we talked about that on our ACQ2 episode with Crusoe CEO Chase Lockmiller. The other element that makes Crusoe special is the environmental angle. Crusoe, of course, locates their data centers at stranded energy sites. So think oil flares, wind farms that can't use all the energy they generate, etc., and uses that power that would otherwise be wasted to run your AI workloads instead. Yep. Obviously, it's a huge benefit for the environment and for customers on costs since Crusoe doesn't rely on the energy grid. Energy is the second largest cost of running AI after, of course, the price you pay NVIDIA for the chips. And these lower energy costs get passed on to customers. It's super cool that they can put their data centers out there in these remote locations where, quote unquote, energy happens, as opposed to the other hyperscalers, such as AWS and Google and Azure, who need to build their data centers close to major traffic hubs where the internet happens because they are doing everything in their clouds. Yep. If you, your company, or your portfolio companies would like to use the lower cost and more performant infrastructure for your AI workloads, go to crusocloud.com slash acquired, that's C-R-U-S-O-E cloud.com slash acquired, or click the link in the show notes. So I'm dying to get to tech themes, um, 
but before we do, I think we should, I think it's worth uh, a minute spending a minute on um, the what would have happened otherwise. Uh, we talked a little bit about somebody else buying LinkedIn. I think mm-hmm. that's probably most likely. Clearly, they were on sale, as you say, in more ways than one. Um, but I think um, you know if the the other route is let's say LinkedIn and managed to stay independent. You know, they'd have a they're having a hard road executing on building another pillar um, of monetization on top of their network asset. Um, but I, I want to throw in here some uh, a bit of discussion that's come out in the press that I think is relevant um, that that somebody pointed out, and I believe there was a I believe there was a New York Times article about this. LinkedIn's stock based compensation um, has uh, grown hugely in the last few years, and it actually was becoming a real problem for them. Um, so, stock based compensation, uh, as probably many of our readers know, you know, is, is a main concept in startups, but al- also in public companies, where part of your equity package as an employee is you get a salary, but then you also get stock options mm-hmm. in the company. And um, and LinkedIn had basically over the last couple of years been giving away huge amounts of equity to employees and that dilutes uh, the existing shareholders so it's a non-cash expense um so it doesn't show up in like ebitda metrics Mm -hmm. and stuff like that but um stock-based comp at at linkedin went from 13 million a quarter in 2012 to 222 million per quarter uh in the first quarter of 2016 um and the problem there is like if you start doing that and compensating your Employees, obviously, I'm a huge believer in employee equity, but um, you know, there's the thing about cap tables is like there's only ever 100. percent Like you can't have more than 100 percent of the equity in the company. So anytime you give more out, you're diluting everybody. Mm-hmm. And so it was like the the LinkedIn stock had become this sort of like leaky sieve um, that was happening. So that was a major problem that they would have had to deal with. But then now they don't. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, I think what would have happened otherwise, I, I you know, they would have gotten sold to Salesforce. And in that case, I wonder for the future of what Microsoft is doing with Dynamics if they lose out on this deal. Because I feel like that's a nail in the coffin for Salesforce. You mean a nail in the coffin for Dynamics? I'm sorry, for Dynamics. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's go into, let's jump into tech themes because this is, uh, man, I've I've said this to so many people over the years, um, you know, that uh, as a investor, I've been such a huge fan of LinkedIn um and uh continue to be uh D- david when did you buy linkedin stock uh, i bought right after the ipo um and then i bought a bunch more after february 5th <laughs> um and the reason for that is you know uh, like we've been discussing you know there are major challenges for the business and the company but to me there is so few uh real true network effects that um exist in technology and linkedin's is so powerful um I don't believe that anyone, perhaps, you know, ever, ever is a long time, but any time in the foreseeable future will be able to disrupt LinkedIn. Software alone is just software. Like, it's just a commodity. Somebody will build something better. It will come along. But, and LinkedIn is such the classic example. Like, it looks like crap. Like, let's all be honest. Like, the product is really bad at this point. Hasn't Yeah, you have like 10 second page load times. Yeah, it's really, really bad. But like, Nobody will ever beat it. Like I will always use it. I'll use it every day because everybody I need to interact with is on it. And if I leave and go somewhere else, they're not on it. You know, so like Yeah. And the only thing like I can envision a future where people chip away in verticals and then those verticals expand, but we're a ways out from that. And the couple things I'm thinking of are, you know, um when recruiting developers, it's very common to start on GitHub. Exactly. And then all of a sudden, there's all this data that is not actually in LinkedIn that's so much more actionable. And it's like, oh, it's it just the, the mere, um, you know, breadcrumb trail that they've left from doing their work creates a much richer profile. Or you can imagine sort of the same thing on AngelList. Like it, it, it moves out from founders and VCs to employees and then people are actually incentivized to keep their angel list profile up to date that proliferates yep. to other industries design there's a company called behance that adobe bought that was doing this um totally agree if you were going to attack linkedin this is the only way to do it because yeah. it's the only way where you can actually get enough critical mass like a network is is of zero value until it is of critical mass value and then it is of like completely defensible value right. um but uh but it's i really think it it would it would be a fool's errand to try and 
build a horizontal wide based uh, professional network at this point. Yeah, I mean, in the same way that it would be foolish to build a horizontal video hosting platform at this point or a horizontal um, pure social network. Like I think the era of horizontal platform, horizontal platforms, once they have network effects applied, you don't disrupt them by building another horizontal platform. And I think that, um, you yeah. know, that's, that's, that's just an interesting thing to note when you're thinking about um, starting new startups. Cause I've heard so many people say LinkedIn sucks. I'm going to try and unseat it and disrupt LinkedIn. And like, yeah, we all have our product qualms, but you're not going to do it by creating a better horizontal LinkedIn. Yep. And and I think this plays, um, for me, at one point I want to bring up about the acquisition that um, plays really strongly in here is LinkedIn, like, they, they're, they're smart guys, right? Like, uh, and, and gals, like, they, they get this. Um, so what has LinkedIn been more terrified of than anything else in its history? It's people exfiltrating <laughs> the network, right, right off there. of LinkedIn and str- and stealing it out and bootstrapping it and, comp- and competing with them. And LinkedIn is famously, like, just iron fisted in their uh, their terms about you know their API limits or your ability to um, store data that you retrieve from LinkedIn. They, they they have the most locked down quote unquote open API. Yeah, I've ever the API seen. is a joke. It is an utter joke. Um, and so one of the things that gets me really excited about LinkedIn being part of Microsoft um, as a uh, as a as a user, as a user of products, um, and as a um, you know as a, as as somebody who is has a high, huge vested interest in innovation in the future, is man, could this mean the dawn of a real LinkedIn API? Because Microsoft has a very different set of motivations than than LinkedIn. Um, and so, so long as they keep the network effect locked, so long as they keep the network effect, but it'll also be embedded into all of Microsoft's products, right? And right. Microsoft is is also a developer facing company, and so like if they open up the LinkedIn API to, I mean, I think about like even like venture capital firms, like so many firms are building data, um, you know, tools uh, internally for themselves uh, to be able to identify people who might be founders, great founders before they start companies, or people who might be interested in joining startups before they do who are really talented and you've just been totally hamstrung because you can't really use the linkedin api very well um but if now all of a sudden you can like man think about all the cool products and services they're going to be enabled enabled by that you can um i'll just caveat this with like david remember venture capitalists are a niche market (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly exactly um but uh uh there's so many more examples too yeah good point uh, should we grade it? Um, yeah, th- I think there was one. Oh, I have, oh, a, I have a question yeah. I want to pose to you. Yep. Um, so there, it is in Microsoft's interest to integrate LinkedIn with all of their products. Keep in mind, Microsoft also owns now the Link- LinkedIn product and has an incentive to make that revenue stream profitable. So mm-hmm. do they... Which it is on, uh, well, without accounting for a stock-based compensation. Yep. Um, or I, I should say as successful as possible, do they do a bunch of Google apps integrations also? The, mm. Microsoft starts to encounter or potentially could encounter, well, it'll be interesting to see how they navigate this, the platform versus product tensions where, you know, famously they didn't want to release Office for iPad because... As you know all too well. <laughs> because it competed with the competitive advantage that, that um, Surface had. Or, you know, in, in a million other ways, you know, it, Office and Windows always having tension. Do you run into a scenario here or is there a clear, um, you know, subservient product and leader product where it's, nope, we're not focused on growing LinkedIn through other people's integrations. And that is a sole, um, you know, source of value for other products at Microsoft. I mean, I got to imagine I'll be really disappointed in Microsoft and Satya and Kurt and everybody if if they take the the old school microsoft approach i can't shots see them fired. doing that you know? shots fired <laughs> um but i mean like you know this is this is the whole thing about you know satya's leadership at microsoft is like the way that this company becomes relevant again and and uh and an, not re- the, an innovator again i mean hey i mean some might argue relevant again like yeah. technology moves fast right it's like ferris bueller you know you <laughs> you might miss it if you don't stop and look around every once in a while mobile <laughs> mobile yeah um but man like you know 
office on iPad. Like I want to be everywhere where you are. And like, so if, if LinkedIn, all the value that they're going to hopefully go try and create in, in, you know, bringing LinkedIn to sales and other verticals isn't on Salesforce too. Like, you know, that's a big fail for them. Yep. Um, okay. Conclusion. What do you got, Ben? Or, uh, and so we, how are we going to do this? Like, this is, um, are we grading like right now the buy or are we predicting the future and thinking like, yeah, put, put yourself five years from now. Was this a good purchase for this price? So, I mean, I think like today sitting here, I say this is a great buy because a year ago ish, you know, LinkedIn was worth twice this much. Um, and it's this incredibly unique, incredibly defensible asset that is now part of Microsoft. So I'm like huge thumbs up. Um, but by that rubric, you know, God, it's really just going to be like, can they execute on this? You know, Mm -hmm. the opportunity is massive, but, but with great, you know, with great opportunity comes great, you know, there's a lot of complexity here and it is very difficult to do these things. Um, it's all going to come down to execution. So right, right now I'm going to give it a, I'm going to give it an A, a minus right now uh just accounting for the huge amount of risk to to come in the in the execution how are we both positive on this i was gonna give it an a like i i I woke up monday morning being like what (laughs) and here i am all right but here's here's i have some a a couple rationales but one is you know in november of 2015 the, the stock price was at 255 okay so not quite twice as much but right and and they they bought it for what one 190 ish um I, you know, I don't think the company is actually worth less. And if you look at it like it's 25 or what is it? They bought it for 26 billion and it was, it's a little over 3 billion in revenue. So like an 8x, you know, yeah, right. I mean, like there's a, like it's, it's to actually, acquire a, um, very, you know, a sort of premier, um, internet and SaaS company for seven to eight X revenue, like, those companies were trading on the public markets at 10 to 15 X revenue like a year ago, you know, before accounting for any kind of liquidity premium, you know, M and a premium. So like, yeah, great buy. Yeah. So that that's operating under the assumption that LinkedIn continued its trajectory. Um, you have the, the risk that typically comes with a startup acquisition the startup, uh, uh, any M and A thing of of uh, integration failing. I can't really consider LinkedIn a startup. No, of integration failing, and and you know, there's um the bigger the acquisition, the far the farther you can fall. And a twenty six billion dollar write down would be truly like a gut punch. And I think um, you know, this co- kind of comes down to two things. I think they needed to make this acquisition or acquisitions like this because that's their future bet. Yep. They're they're this cloud services company and you know this is a a cloud service that is right in their wheelhouse delivering value to enterprises to make them more productive and efficient and do their best work possible the question is could they did they need to do large m a to do it Um, like they they need a a product offering like this for companies Um, they weren't going to build their own linkedin that was going to fail miserably um you know what? What else could they possibly have done? I, I think I do have faith in this new Microsoft much more so than the Microsoft of of old days that is famous for flubbed um, flubbed M and A. Yeah. And I think when I say old days, I'll just say under Steve Ballmer. And um, you know, I think with Satya's leadership and the people, I, I really have a lot of faith in the people leading these integrations. And I think that, like, you know. We'll probably end up doing a follow up episode yeah. one way or another. But well, I, and here's I'm, I'm so bullish. here's something interesting that we haven't talked about at all on this episode, but I think is really relevant. This is by far the biggest acquisition we have covered on this episode. Like the scale of this, like this, maybe I'm just trying to do some quick math in my head, but like the value of this acquisition is approaching the combined value of all the other companies we've talked about combined. Um, Maybe slightly less, but it's like on the same, you know, it's in the right, same ballpark. We haven't done WhatsApp yet. We haven't done WhatsApp yet. So, you know, um, is linked, is Microsoft buying LinkedIn worth, uh, you know, what do we got here? Pixar, Instagram, Twitch, Bungie, Siri, Lucasfilm, YouTube, Accompli, Rightly, you know, Virgil, like, whew, that's a lot of money. Yeah. 
I don't think you can really look at it through that lens. You have to look at it like, what was the cost of not doing it? Yep. And I think you got to pull the trigger. Yeah. Well, um, hats off uh, for now, at least to uh, Microsoft and uh, and all our friends over there. Yeah. So. And and to and to you know folks at LinkedIn. I think yeah, the big man. the big question will be like, can these cultures mesh? Um, you know, are they gonna? LinkedIn has offices all over the world, but primarily centered in Silicon Valley. Microsoft typically doesn't do well with their Silicon Valley campuses. But as we, as Kurt talked about a few months ago, like, you know, they have a new mindset when it comes to M and A of like, yeah, we don't care where you are. Like, you know, you can be in, uh, you can be Wonderlist here in Berlin. You can be a Compli. You can be in Silicon Valley. Like, doesn't matter. You know. Yeah, just a lot of flights. Yep. Fortunately, they're close. Well, fortunately, um, you know, Alaska, Bob Virgin. So <laughs> that's a that's a great place to leave that. That's a great place to leave it. Should we do do we want to do a quick carve out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, mine's super quick because I think a lot of people probably will have seen it already. But um, the code conference was uh, last week, and it was bookended by Elon and uh, and Jeff Bezos. And I haven't watched the Jeff one yet, but the Elon Musk one is so fantastic. So go watch the Elon Musk interview at the code conf. Um, he he just like has this incredible way of dancing back and forth between like total dude in a space suit that is like talking about the future in a way where you're like what is this <laughs> where he, is this the one where he says uh there's like an 80 percent chance we're living in a computer simulation yeah, yeah yeah but then there's other things where like the way that he explains why the um first stage rocket lands on the drone ship it, unfortunately it blew up today but to, you know the last four have landed on the drone ship he he does a really good job of like explaining why the drone ship needs to be where it needs to be and position the ocean and and for anybody that's sort of like into the spacex story understanding any of the physics behind that super approachable very interesting and clearly a visionary cool i i am i am grinning widely here because uh literally no joke was my 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 carve out was was the bezos talk at the <laughs> uh, so this is great because i have not yet watched the elon talk so now i gotta watch it and you gotta watch and everybody listening has to watch the bezos talk it is fantastic um you know he uh man that guy is just awesome um but uh um one of my a couple of quick things that i love from it um you know one you know they ask him like what uh God, there's so much going on at Amazon. Like, how do you think about this? Like, how do you think about your businesses? And he says, and I think about innovation. He's like, I like to think about when I'm starting, when we're starting um, a project or something super ambitious, uh, you know, like Alexa or whatnot. Like, um, what about our customers isn't going to change, uh, you know, over in the foreseeable future? Like, um, you know, so much is changing so fast in technology. But what are are the, like, core things that are not going to change? Um and and also that that reminds me of linkedin you know like i sit here today like i was a linkedin happy linkedin shareholder for a long time because i just sat there and i was like i'm gonna be using linkedin 20 years from now no doubt in my mind you know so anyway there we go code conference it was good this year awesome all right listeners we have a long time favorite acquired company to tell you about modern treasury modern treasury is the software platform that turns money movement operations into code Yeah, for years now, services like Stripe, Adyen, and Square have enabled developers to accept credit card payments in apps. But that's only the tip of the iceberg of what a business needs to fully handle the movement of money in and out of their company. Those payment actions from Stripe and Adyen, etc., flowed through to ledger systems and then reconciliations, compliance verifications. And that's before any cash actually moves between institutions, which, of course, involves banking operations. Yes, their APIs, of course, work with Plaid, Stripe, Intuit, etc., but also with their incredible banking partner network with over 30 banks, meaning that for the first time, you literally can turn your banking operations at any of those institutions into software. This means faster payments, easy adoptions of new payment rails when they come out, like FedNow. It means automatic reconciliation and real-time financial data. This lets you move money at the speed of software, which, as we now know, after the first half of 2023, being able to move money fast is very important. Yes, we love Modern Treasury so much. The founders and really the whole team have become close friends of Ben and mine, really back to when they first got started. And this is a very cool full circle moment that just happened. We just emceed their first big conference here in San Francisco, Transfer, which happened at the beginning of June. 
Yes. If your business involves money movement, be it a marketplace, fintech platform, real estate, lending, investing, or anyone who reconciles or moves money, go on over to moderntreasury.com slash acquired and make sure that when you get in touch, you tell them that Ben and David sent you. Well, uh, we're leaving you. Um, I'll, I'll say one more time because I think it's probably more useful at the, the end of the episode than the beginning. Um, would love it if you could leave us a uh, uh, review on, on iTunes. And uh, if you liked it, share the episode with your friends. See ya. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Huh.